how long of a podcast do you think we'd do if it was just, hey, you know who's pretty? <laughs> yeah, it would be a long, long podcast. Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSense. Joined, as always, by the voice of CinemaSense, Jeremy Scott. Hello. And from Music Video Sense, Barrett Share. Hi, everyone. Hi, Dr. Nick. <laughs> Today, we're going to go back and reach deep down into the Sin Box. The Sin Box! <laughs> We were oh, trying. We were debating so since it was the last time. It was the last time we did this. I was like, "Is it sin box or sin bag?" Either way, <laughs> it sounds dirty, and I love it. <laughs> and we'll reach deep down into it. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> we will fist some <laughs> mail out of this. It's a box full of sin. <laughs> That's right, fistful of sin box. <laughs> God. This went off the rails very quickly. It did. In Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, there's a line early on where one of the characters says something like, Relax. Anything in here is dead by now. I wrote about six different versions of my old college girlfriend since. Before before I finally said, Man, I'm reaching a little bit on this. I'm going to let it go. Oh, my God. Um, We might have better answers for your questions than that intro. Oh, we definitely do. So, uh, anyway, let's start right into the questions. Question. Question. I got something to say. I am listening. Barrett. Yeah. Oh, man, we love it. And I know that we haven't gotten to questions very often recently, so we wanted to devote an entire episode to it. These are all your questions. Some, some have been hanging around for a while. Yes. Some are brand new. Some have been on emails for <laughs> like five or six different episodes, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're finally getting to that. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for your patience. Okay. The first one is, hey, guys, coming at you from Broken Hill in Outback, Australia. That place does not exist. That's a fiction. That's right. Uh, I'm joking. Love the podcast. Absolutely smashing them. Ooh, no, that's Australian lingo for <laughs> fucking. Here's a, here's a question. After the disappointment of Assassin's Creed, as many, many other video game movies, what are some video games that you would think would make great movies, and who would you cast as the protagonist? Hmm. That's like the most Australian email ever. We're smashing them. Yeah, go for it. What do you got? Um, well, there was a, this is, this is old school, guys. This is some old school shit that I'm about to bring Zork? up. Zork? Zork. No. Zork, um, <laughs> Zork would make a terrible movie. It really would. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, there was a game I played on the PC with my brothers called Gabriel Knight Sins of the Fathers. Okay. And, uh, it's, uh, it was one of those, uh, walk around point and click puzzle games that were popular in the 80s and 90s, yeah. like Space Quest and Police Quest and, for some of you, Leisure Vision Suit Quest. Larry. Vision <laughs> Quest. But for some of you, Leisure Suit Larry yeah, even man. was one of those type of games. But um, but Gabriel Knight uh, had, a, had a main character voiced by Tim Curry. It, way back in 1993, Tim hmm. Curry lent his voice to Gabriel Knight. Wow. Is that Congo Tim Curry? Uh, that's before Congo. It's before wow. that was ninety five, wasn't it? it was, yeah, not Congo was ninety five. So this was nineteen ninety three. Wow, what was this cool? was put like maybe host uh, post Home Alone two Tim Curry or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, there were there were a, uh, it was a pretty good cast in this game itself, even back in ninety three. And this was sort of when video games were getting into getting actors and stuff like yeah. that they were finally showing cut scenes that had real film quality and stuff this doesn't this is gra- this is all graphics until they get to the sequel which is where they they change a lot of shit and it was very disorienting <laughs> to see like the <laughs> it's not tim curry playing the main guy yeah. it's like all sorts of stuff but anyway uh tim curry played uh mark hamill was in this uh Ooh. leah remini uh, Michael Dorn, Rocky Carroll, they all lent voices, and it was all about voodoo murders in New Orleans. Awesome. Oh. And, uh, and, and yeah, you had to do some stupid shit like you always have to do in these games to get to certain, you know, places and everything. But I think that voodoo murder thing would be an excellent, like, it, it may not be 
like high art or anything, but it would be one of those fun ass fucking movies uh with you know like just you could go crazy with this shit it's like the you know it's the kali ma scene and in temple of doom yeah. stretched out <laughs> into like a whole movie basically um but uh i didn't uh, you know this question has been so long since because this has been one of the, this is one of those <laughs> yeah. i didn't know that it asked who should be in these roles or mm-hmm. whatever I'm trying to think of, you know, somebody who would be a good Gabriel Knight because Tim Curry does a full on New Orleans Cajun accent. What? In this thing. Are you not, serious? Not like crazy, but, but he, he's not but British he's, at all. But he's like, no, he's Holy like, shit. it's like, you know, like there's a point where you try, you know, you click on his assistant, Grace Tucker. That's great. Her name's Grace. You click on her. And of course that the clicking on something means to do that thing or to, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so like you click on Grace and he's like, like I haven't tried. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's and hilarious. stuff like that. Uh, it's just a fun game because you go around, you'd ask questions of people, you know, like it give you a list of questions that you could ask. And depending on what answers, it would give you more questions, so on and so forth. Uh, but, uh, but I, I can't think of anybody right now. Let's just might... import Tim Curry from 1993. Well, I, I feel like we should still have Tim Curry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's that's the game I would make into a movie. The other two, like I, I, I played a little bit of Gabriel Knight 2. Um, and, and I don't remember even what Gabriel Knight 3 was. I don't even remember what they were going with. 2 was about werewolves and stuff. They made three of them. I made three of mm-hmm. them. Uh, the the uh, the woman behind it, the programmer, was a huge deal. She made a lot of these type of games, and this was one of the best that I had ever played. It still it still resonates with me whenever I think about it. Jane Jensen hmm. was her name. Um. So uh. Yeah. That's what I would turn into. And I, I, I'm sorry that you know some of you out there probably never played this game, <laughs> and and you don't know what I'm talking about. But it would make a great movie. The people nice. who did though. Mm-hmm. That's the deep cut for them. They're gonna be like, yes, yeah. he's so right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All the gunters from Ready Player that's One. That's true. <laughs> All right. So I'm going with a uh, a series of games uh from the late '90s, early 2000s called Commandos. Ah. Commandos. Commandos. Uh, there was right. Commandos, Commandos Behind Enemy Lines, and I think there was a third one. Um, and this is a top-down World War II secret mission game where you basically are pointing and clicking. You take you, you point to activate a character, then you point on a spot on the map to make him run to that spot or what have you. And it's kind of a dirty dozen premise. You've got a band of f- four to six guys um, and you're the only allied team being sent into whatever Nazi camp. There's a train one. There's a missile one. They're all awesome, by the way. Um, and you have to kind of figure it out. It doesn't really tell you how to complete the objective. You've just got to figure out how to use the different guys on your team who all have talents. So you've got a spy <laughs> who can dress up in Nazi outfits and soldier outfits and do voices. And so he's a, once he gets an outfit and puts it on, he's able to walk freely about the map. Yeah and gain intel for you you've got a demolitions expert um you've got <laughs> a like marine Fox Force 5. you've got a marine <laughs> you've got a driver um and you've got like a green beret uh who's like the the boss and i ripped through these games because hmm. they were so much fucking fun that might be because i love the dirty dozen movies so much uh they're well-made games this is gonna tap into a wider audience than chris's g- game because more people have played this one uh and i did find because I've recommended this or put this answer down in show notes like seven different times. I did find the one where I came up with some ideas for casting and directors. Ah. I'm just going to read to you what I wrote down. If you played this game, I think you're going to think I'm totally right. Um, I request Guy Ritchie or Edgar Wright direct it and Jude Law play the spy. Oh, nice. It should have a humor heavy reality based tone. Dirty Dozen meets Lock Stock meets the Oceans movies meets Mm. Hot Fuzz. Mm. And then I said, oh, well, Simon Pegg should definitely be the driver and Nick Frost, the demolitions expert. <laughs> but other than that, I'm open to suggestions. Oh, Henry Cavill would make an excellent Marine. And then a Green Beret could be somebody like Chris Hemsworth. Oh, shit, this movie's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, you know, I think one of the reasons that video game movies struggle is that they start with a video game that is popular. And a lot of the popular video games don't have stories that translate well to a two-hour movie right imagine telling a grand theft auto video game story 
in a condensed movie. It's either too big or, or too small, exactly. basically. Exactly. And and video game narratives are are written entirely different. Now, I think we're getting closer. Like, I think they're going to make a movie about The Last of Us, which I think is an answer I'll give later for another question. Oh, yeah. um, and I think that could work because that's a game that was made very cinematically with a, with a very, like, the story is every bit as important as the action in that game. Did you did you ever finish The Last of Us, by the way? Uh, I did. Okay, because I remember there was a time where you, like, played it and then I guess you, you had a hiatus? Yes, a, a big one. Yeah, okay. And then you came back and beat it. Yeah. Um, and it's great. I, in fact, the ending of that game is what I'm going to talk about later in the podcast. Hmm. Um, so I think we're getting closer. We, we are going to have a good movie made out of a video game, but it needs to come from a video game that has a, a solid story mechanics that you can work with, right? And so I feel like if you take the Ocean style of film, Ocean's Eleven style film, and then you put it into a Dirty Dozen kind of setting, World War II, you know, small team of bandits. They, ha- they all have special skills. They have to execute everything perfectly to p- treat it more like a heist, mm-hmm. right? Um, whether it's an assassination or stealing the secret plans or what have, I think that movie would totally rule. And even people like you could market it in such a way that people who never even knew it was a video game might find an interest in it. And that's part of what you need to do as opposed to making Prince of Persia with Jake Gyllenhaal. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah, you would have to, you'd have to definitely take out like expendables type of, you know, feel of this where it's more about (laughs) blowing away a whole bunch of people and winning that way. Right. No, it's more about sneaking and Mm -hmm. tricking and knowing exactly. It's more like chess. Yeah. And using the abilities. That's why, you know, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle worked so well. Exactly. And that's why the first Avengers worked so well, you know because they were all using This would thing. be an awesome movie. I don't think anybody's got the balls to make a movie like this, by the way. Uh, Put in a Green Beret, a Marine, all this other stuff, yeah. and maybe not kill anybody? <laughs> yeah. Like, the, that's the type of thing. I'm sitting there thinking about how awesome this would be, like an Oceans-type movie without, you know, uh, without any, like, killing at all. Well, and that's the thing. Even in the game, you had to avoid killing most of the time. And because anytime you killed anybody, first of all, you had to like knife them and then hide the body. Because <laughs> yeah. if you shot somebody, alarms went off. Yeah. yeah. And like every bad guy on the map has like a vision cone so you can see what they can see and can't. And you have to like stay out of their vision. It would be much more about stealth and planning and, and heisting than killing. I don't, rem- I don't know if this was the first game to do it, but I know that uh, Metal Gear Solid. Mm-hmm. had that kind of that, that yes. was one of the first awesome. times it ever had that type of thing where you you could kill a guard if you wanted to but you better not leave the body around because right. one of the other wandering guards would see it yep which is you know something that before games before never bothered to think about that yeah they just disappeared yeah, right? like yeah, in yeah. wolfenstein they just kind of right. floated away yeah and you uh you know who's making the metal gear solid movie, yes right? no jordan vogue roberts oh really yes <laughs> been working on for like a year and a half or something like that he's a super fan yeah well hopefully he can make it as good as kong skull there you go <laughs> fingers crossed at least <laughs> fingers crossed yeah i like that idea a lot oh yeah me too that's why i've been dying to talk this is the one question i've been regretting so hard that we haven't gotten to because i love this answer what so platform much. was it on a uh, pc is where i played oh, it really? I, you can still play actually last night i downloaded two i, I downloaded the first game and behind enemy lines hmm. through steam Mm. um so whatever they whatever they do on steam to make it playable on a modern pc i opened it up last night and almost played a mission but it was like midnight and i was thinking ah, hmm. probably not a good idea. i actually might do that because it'd be five o'clock exactly exactly uh yeah so you guys went oh, like kind of uh cinematic i'm going very simple and bare bones i want to make mike tyson's punch out no oh, right? Right? <laughs> We, I think we've definitely dated we, ourselves with this fucking question. We, we need more boxing movies, right? Well, okay, I, but but not exactly like that. I want to make it like a like a like a blood sport, uh, kickboxer type of type of movie, okay. right? Directed by Gareth Evans from The Raid. <laughs> okay. Oh wow, okay. Uh, and I didn't cast the rest of them, but I you know, I'm just thinking about like who would play Glass Joe and like Bald Bull and all those mm-hmm. guys, Piston Honda, which is totally everything was racist. Back yeah, then. yeah. Uh, but the person that I came up to play, Little Mac, who's the protagonist that's tiny, mm-hmm. uh, is Daniel Radcliffe. Okay. All right. First of all, guy can get jacked. Like he's he's gotten like swole before, right? And the other thing is he's five five. <laughs> is he really? He's fucking tiny. Mm. And I think he could probably play a good, you know, sink your teeth. I into for a second there, you're going to go with DJ Qualls. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. What is DJ Qualls doing these days? I, I don't he, know. I think he he's on one of those pops, like NCIS shows somewhere. No, he pops up from time and again. He was in um uh, the uh what's the um Amazon show that everybody 
latched on to. It's had three seasons. Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? No. Man in the High Castle? Yeah, that's okay. it. He was in that, and he was in another show I saw recently, too. So he's... he's uh, DJ Qualls. He's going around from TV show to TV show. Good for him. Yeah, man. <laughs> he's, mean, from, he's from Tennessee. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I had yeah. forgotten that. Maybe he can be the trainer for Little Mac. I don't mean to sound like mean, by the way. No, I just I'm, what I'm saying is that like just a straightforward bare bones fighting it's been a while since we've gotten one of these movies besides the raid or dread i guess uh the original raid because the original raid was almost a video game right like oh, you're yeah. fighting levels and levels and levels and you could do this in the context of like uh like a punch out type of thing yes it's a boxing movie but it's more about the fight itself and the guy behind it than the actual like you know somebody's you know, somebody's sister cousin uncle or something is going to have to die first <laughs> Then he'll go into the ring, and it's got to have no rules because that's the way those Jean Claude. And Van there has to be totally, at least four montages. Yes, <laughs> mostly of shifting yeah. gears. You can't you can't show all of the fights. That would be stupid. Like do what Mortal Kombat does and show like piles of bodies. <laughs> and she did didn't broke. even know. <laughs> By the way, is Mortal Kombat in the running for best video game movie of all time? Well, I think it's been in the discussion. Which is pathetic, but because it it does hold a sort of nostalgic kind of kitsch value. Uh -huh. I I don't think the movie's very good, no. uh, and I don't think even people who like it would would really stand that firm behind it. Um, but what are you going to throw up there in its place? Not Assassin's Creed. I Not mean, that, Super every Mario Brothers. Single one of them has yeah. a fan following. The Resident mm -hmm. Evil movies have fans, but those oh, yeah, movies yeah, are all terrible. would be Resident Evil yeah. or um the uh. uh one that is frequently cited uh, silent hill silent hill i like that movie a lot silent hill might be the one that's considered the gold standard that's probably the most like fleshed out story mm -hmm. of any video game movie that i've seen resident evil was more about like the aliens type of like you know rah rah yeah. marines come in that kind of thing but those are those are basically the three i mean the other ones have all had are all horrible reviewed movies mm -hmm. final fantasy um, did you ever see final super fantasy? mario brothers no i never saw it mm. oh the the final fantasy cgi movie yeah oh balls it's terrible yeah <laughs> it's just boring though it's not like offensive balls <laughs> yeah balls well is it was it uh is it true that i can't remember if this was true or not or if it was just one of those rumors that mike tyson thought he was supposed to be unbeatable in the game oh that sounds exactly like the kind of thing he would believe <laughs> I mean, especially back, like that's especially back true. then, especially <laughs> yeah. back then. Well, that's uh, one of the things that uh, who's it? Uh, uh, Bill Simmons said that there's certain certain people on this earth that if you s made up anything about them, it sounds true. <laughs> it's a, it's and Mike Tyson, Tyson is right? one yeah. of them. Yeah. And uh, but uh, I, I was I, I remember when that I never had a, an NES. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that original NES. But I remember people playing that game saying he's just goddamn impossible. Oh, to he was so hard. And, so hard. But I did hear people eventually saying, yeah, I finally beat. Oh, him yeah. No, that, so. I, I beat him. I got to where I could. It's all about timing. Like you got a you got a block for however many, and you get your hearts and all it's that just stuff. Patterns, yeah. And then then you you dodge and all that stuff. And once I got into that rhythm, I beat him for the first time. I like threw that shit across the room and like ran around like yeah yeah. That was Daniel Radcliffe for a <laughs> yeah, second. That's right. <laughs> that was our first question. This is our second question. We're gonna get through four. That's right. What movie and its prequel or prequels do you think would have been better with the prequel released first and then the original movie as the sequel? This is actually a very interesting question that ultimately I found very difficult. Mm -hmm. Because Me in too. almost every case, there's very good reason why the prequel has come later. Mm -hmm. And if I try and picture the prequel coming first and informing my knowledge, in almost every case, it breaks down the enjoyment of the one I know as the original. Yeah. Go ahead. What do you have? What do yeah, you have no, that's the same about the thing that I was uh, about to say with what my answer was, because most prequels rely on, ironically the films that technically come after them in chrono chronological order to make their movie so like you know all the star wars prequels are based on that you've seen the other movies before even though this is all coming before all those movies you know mm -hmm. um i don't know if people consider the hobbit a prequel i do because it because they threw in so many things yeah. that yeah that require Lord of the Rings, like, you know, nerdgasm knowledge mm -hmm. to know and everything. Um, if they had made that before, which is what it technically 
is i mean it's it's the the book was written first yeah, right, yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know, so. well, yeah, you got gandalf before the gandalf of lord of the rings right and you got bilbo before frodo right yeah, yeah. so yeah. so it, it's you know in a weird way if it had been made beforehand you would not be calling it a prequel but um he would just be calling it the first of four right, right, chapters right. of whatever but uh i i consider the hobbit movie series to be prequels because of all the things that they share in common with prequels that you see. Um, I think we would have had an engaged Peter Jackson at the time mm -hmm. uh, directing The Hobbit. We wouldn't have had this fantasy about making three movies out of it. That's right, because the, you didn't have the success of the, the, That's correct. the sequel. That's correct. I don't think they would have gone through that. Because before Lord of the Rings, nothing was being cut into two. Mm -mm. It took Kill Bill to really start that ball rolling mm. uh and then it, you know there was some discussion after Pr prisoner of azkaban uh, alfonso cuaron was like oh it would have been nice to split this up into two that's oh, where we, that? yeah that's why we oh. started getting that type of thing uh a lot well i mean and that and just seeing how successful yeah, kill bill exactly. was yeah. but um but so yeah i think we've gotten engaged peter jackson we've gotten better effects we've gotten uh, a cast that really cared and everything i mean the cast probably cared in this other hobbit but i mean how i don't think they care as nearly as much as they would have had this been the first mm -hmm. and everything the question then becomes though does lord of the rings change if he makes the hobbit first mm. does is the movie are the movies that we love from the lord of the rings are they any different now if he makes the hobbit first hmm. and uh you almost would have to say yes uh part of it is you know they didn't i don't think they had the effects to do Gollum at the time before they started making lord of the rings because remember in the first one they just kind of have his arms and show maybe his face in a shadow or mm. something and then by the time it gets to the two towers they're like oh okay we just caught up we can get all this you know uh, Although every, even if you look at if you look at Gollum in the Two Towers and then Gollum in the Hobbit movies, like he almost looks a little fakey in the Two Towers compared to how much they've grown since then. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> but um, yeah, I love everything about this idea, and this is how they should have always done it. There's something I I think I'm alone. I I lived with a Tolkien nerd for a good five ten years, uh, obsessed, and and he would probably smack me if I said I like the Hobbit more than the trilogy in terms of the books mm -hmm. and uh, the hobbit would have been a great introduction to this world because it's so much lighter it's not there's not so much end of the world death and fire it's just a short little adventure with a a little guy a wizard and a dragon yeah. and st stretching it out to three movies was always the wrong idea and part of why those movies suck so much is the bloat they had to infuse them all with yeah. i like this idea a lot i think it would have worked fine um I always felt like Bilbo's story in the beginning of Fellowship is just hollow. There's no oh, yeah. emotion to his age and his desire to disappear again and have an adventure. And if we'd have had that kind of informing us, it might have made it a little more special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. And and and, and you know, you think about back back in that day too. I mean, there's a possibility that i mean this is you're talking about new line cinema we've just we've talked about a couple of the movies that they've made in the 90s mortal Kombat. yeah we just did a spawn video they made movies like that back in the 90s just before this came out yeah. um they were taking a huge gamble with lord of the rings sure huge and uh and they may have thought there's no way we can do just the hobbit and then expect the other three to jump off from that um because they may have just thought we're already taking a big huge risk so why start it with the one that i don't know do people does average joe uh read a book guy like do they know the hobbit more or do they know lord of the Rings before the movies came out right the hobbit or the lord of the I rings say, trilogy i would say the hobbit you would i think, think, so? I think yeah. average joe and I'm saying average Joe might not even have read any of these books, mm. but he knows The Hobbit way more than Lord of the Rings. Tolkien fans, anybody that's read them all, I think the majority are fans of the trilogy first. Mm -hmm. um, I know some that would rather read The Cimmerillion than read The Hobbit. <laughs> now, we're talking about you know, people who've spent time translating Elvish. Yeah, man. But um, <clears throat> anyway, good, good pick. All right. Nice. I'm going to use this question as an excuse to just 
whine a little bit about Better Call Saul. All right, all right. Because I, I st- I'm still watching this show, and I'm still finding it to be quality. The yes. acting is great. I think the directing and some of the camera work is off the charts. Mm-hmm. But it does not have the emotional impact for me, and it, it seems to have less the more we go on. And specifically, have you guys seen the most recent episode? Mm-hmm. I have not seen okay. the most recent one. So then I won't say what I was about to say. Um, but there are things in this most recent episode that feel like fan service. And we've spent a great deal this season about the building of the lab. Oh, my mm, God. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the stuff that's good, the reason I'm still watching is all the stuff with Jimmy and Kim. Yes. And pretty much any of the stuff with Jimmy. The problem for me continues to be that Jimmy feels like a recurring character on his own show. <laughs> And we're spending as much or more time with Nacho and Gus and Mike and now this new guy who you've seen that episode where he showed up at the end cooking in the restaurant. And I'm just like, first of all, I almost think this all would have been played played better if it had gone in this order first. If we'd seen all of Better Call Saul, I would not have the expectations I have from Breaking Bad of whammy moments. But Better Call Saul has not given me a single episode like the episode where Walt watched Jesse's girlfriend choke to death That's in true. her bed, where I stood up out of my chair and covered my mouth in horror. <laughs> yeah. Better Call Saul has given me nothing like that. Um, but breaking, it is a different show. I know Guillermo del Toro, del Toro, del Toro <laughs> wrote about how the reason he likes it better is that the changes in Jimmy are smaller. Mm-hmm. And it's more of a micro, and it's more fascinating to him to see those evolutions, whereas Walt's character went from good to evil in a much more drastic arc. And I, I get that. I just don't think that makes it a better show. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just a trendy thing for people to say right now, because it is high quality and because a lot of the fan service notes do hit. <sighs> it's, it's, it's getting grating now. It like- is. It is, because... There's a moment in this episode where somebody says something to Gus, and it's specifically written to make you think Walt is in the next room. Right. Yeah. No. Right. I, yes. Yes. And and I mean, bringing in fucking Gale. Yeah. Like, are you, are you fucking kidding me right now? Like, <laughs> it took you. We when we talked about this, like, I don't know, four or five episodes ago. You guys, I think, were at this point that you're at that I am now at. It t- it took a couple more episodes for me to get there. But there's too much of that. It's like there's they're setting up Jimmy and Kim to have these emotional moments either by themselves or together or something like that. And it's all these monologues and stuff like that. And it's char- like there's a, a great monologue from Jimmy in this most recent episode. But it's like they're just setting that up and then boom, we're back to Nacho or boom, we're back to Mike or the fucking lab crew, man. I'm fucking sick of that shit. Well, and I don't I can again. I did not need more evidence that Gus Fring was cold and calculated. Yes. Yes, exactly. I got enough of that in Breaking Bad. So I wonder if ultimately this is just a selfish thing, that if I'd seen them in this order, a Better Call Saul would have been a, a lighthearted, more lighthearted, dramatic, dramedy kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then Breaking Bad could come along and let's go hard into this crime world and everything's going to be amped up. But I don't know. I'm just I, I'm, I'm going to watch all the way to the goddamn end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's starting to disappoint. That me. lab thing does seem like they thought, Oh, this is a cool thing. Let's let's they 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 do seem to be focused a lot of times on what are, what are the professional aspects of building such a lab underneath this thing. It would be cool to for us to see how such a lab was built under secrecy with these German guys and all sort of stuff and everything. But at the same time, we don't have very much other than a few episodes of Breaking Bad. There are the that lab has no really special significance to us at all because most of the time the only the only only ones are the fly episode mm-hmm. uh the one where and it, no the, the box one, cutter i guess the box cutter yeah. episode and then the one where um he's like trying to evade the cameras that's really the only episodes that really have much to do with that lab and yes, it is part of Breaking Bad. It's a big part of Breaking Bad. But most of the time we ever got to that lab, it was them done for the day. And yeah, just, I don't care. <laughs> you know, I don't care about it. Yeah. And, and yeah, while it is kind of interesting to see them build it and what the circumstances were and all that, we all, I mean, I'm, I think, I don't know what, what they're exploring here, but I feel like all these German guys are going to die by the end of this. I mean, a couple of, it could have been a decent F yes. or G story. 
but it's a B and C story. Yeah. And they're just devoting so much time to it. Again, I think I love everybody. I really do. But I feel like they got so much of the gang back together. It just kind of became almost like wet, hot American summer. Yeah. Where like the quality deteriorates over time because you're having more fun with the reunion than we are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was my I don't even know. I think I cheated, but Better Call Saul is annoying me. I, I, I think I think that's the that's sort of the the point about prequels, right? Where we're so focused on what is uh exciting about breaking bad and getting to that point and everything that we're really taking detours that don't really matter yep. so, so much and that whole jimmy and kim thing has been the great thing about the show mm-hmm. uh ever since it started and uh probably because they got a lot of comment cards or whatever it was that you know well that said, the show has never been highly rated mm-hmm. uh whereas breaking bad went out a hit oh yeah uh Better Call Saul has been critically lauded. It's gotten plenty of nominations, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if AMC was somewhere in the last year or two like, okay, we'll give you another season, but you have got to bring Gus Fring in more. We need X yeah. amount of screen time. For, we got to draw in some of these be- Breaking Bad viewers who haven't made the trip over yet. It's got to be what's going on. Yeah. Anyway. Have they announced a plan for that? Like Breaking Bad said five seasons pretty early on, right? Or like um, at the end of three or something like that. At the that. end of three, they I think they announced the end, and then with Better Call Saul, I think they've been assuming five seasons. We're getting to the timeline to where it's going to start really overlapping. You know, that's what I thought too. But I read a recap of this most recent episode that pointed out something in that episode proved we were still four years away. Yeah, from where Breaking Bad starts from the when it starts or when he meets Gus. No, when it's either when it starts or when he meets um Saul which oh, is season 2. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um so hmm. I don't, again there there's room to play with there but it does sort of feel imminent. Yeah. Um but again we don't know how long Gus was cooking in the underground lab before I don't fucking care. <laughs> What's your answer to this question? I mentioned a long time ago how I had seen uh this thing called the Godfather Saga. Oh yeah. Where they put it in chronological order. It's good. I looked that shit up. Do, have you seen it? Do you yeah. remember? You've seen it. They were running it on Stars or Showtime for a good while. Okay. Apparently, it was like, it was a one and done thing. It was like broadcast on, like, it may have been AMC, actually. Okay. And it hasn't been, like, released on DVD or anything like that. Okay. Um. So, when I saw it, like, it was, it was a, a relatively rare thing. But it works so fucking well mm. chronologically. Mm. And I think you could get away with releasing... Most of the stuff in Godfather 2 before The Godfather. Mm-hmm. It works way better than you think it will. I know. Yeah, exactly. Because even though you do have that knowledge going into it, it's almost weird because you, you already have the knowledge and then they put it in chronological order. And somehow that does make sense, even though you already had that. No, I don't know. Yeah. Don't no, know that's an excellent answer. Uh, I saw it, I feel like I saw it twice. I, of course, I always stop by the time we get to the third one because I don't give a shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, my first time through, I was skeptical. Uh, and the second time through, I was like, yeah, this is just great. I want to watch this it's again. It's so fucking I don't weird. know that I ever want to watch it in any other way. And usually when somebody does something like that, um, it's just kitschy. It's just kind of like a gimmick. Yeah. And, it, and it loses the, the coolness of it. But I don't feel like this would. I mean, no, it actually it, it makes Michael's trajectory without those interjections of Vito. Yeah. Uh, which are which are awesome in, its, in their own right. And keeping those categorical um yeah i think it it's it's very very cool i love godfather saga i've seen you've it. seen it too i've seen it a couple okay. of times because yeah i mean godfather 2 takes up pretty much the first hour or so mm-hmm. before they finally even get to the godfather you know yeah and uh and but by that point you've you've already gotten past you know a good chunk of godfather 2 but then godfather and then godfather 2 godfather 2 makes an appearance after yeah. that yeah after the godfather so it's like uh it's just fun the way yeah. it's done i got a question about this that's been bugging me frank pantangeli who was gonna testify to congress against michael right okay uh the guy with the mustache that gets locked up and ends up committing suicide yeah the, the whole the whole uh congress congressional thing where he comes in with his brother, he and Robert Duvall come in with the dude's brother from Italy. Okay. Okay. Do you remember this? Yes. Yes. Okay. What were they planning? What was the end to that? I've always taken that scene to be he brought his brother in and would remind Frank about his honor and his commitment to family I and stuff like that. I think that's what it is. I also thought, though, were they threatening to kill him? 
Hmm. If he if he talked, were they saying we've got your brother here? He's dead. Yeah, I never. It I could, never it thought could be about either that one, right? Um, but I, after a couple of beers one night, I was like, man, <laughs> I wonder what if, uh, if if that actually could have happened. It, yeah, it could. I mean, especially with uh, Duvall walking in with him and everything, right? Is Duvall walking? It's with both him? of them. It's Michael. It's yeah, Michael. Yeah, I think and, that. Uh, I think it's a. It is a kind of a threat. I think. Yeah, I guess. I. It's a completely different way to look at that scene, though. And I was thinking maybe everybody thinks that, like, these they're definitely going to kill the guy, and that's what the threat is. Mm. But I've always watched it as like. This is a reminder of, of your commitment and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. All right. On to our third one. <laughs> this should be a quick one. What comedy movie do you think has the best cinematography? Personally. Huh? Sorry. <laughs> I'm just doing that thing where I say the answer right away. <laughs> I said game night. Uh, <laughs> this person says cats don't dance. I don't know what that Well, means. I'm not going to go prove whether or not they're correct about that. <laughs> I'll just assume they are. Talk about some game night. I just think the cinematography is outstanding. It's ultimately one of the things that I think makes the movie stick with you longer than uh, like another, a comedy shot. If this had been shot like a standard comedy, I don't know that it would have been something I wanted to go back to. There's, I've seen this movie like six or seven times now. There's a different, there's a sort of uh, underlying darkness to everything that's the yeah. way it's being shot. It's not a light, like flat lighted comedy, you know, uh, that we're used to seeing and everything. This is shot like a thriller is yeah. shot. Yeah, and 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 the, everything from the deadbolt when the deadbolt keeps turning side mm-hmm. to side, and the the camera spins like the way the dead oh god the, the the tilt shift that sets all the scenes with the cars looking like tiny little game oh, pieces. Yeah, that's, that's so really awesome. cool. Uh, the fight that they the way they beat the hell out of his brother in the beginning, uh-huh. and they're all like, "Oh, you got to try this cheese." I love that movie. <laughs> um, but it's it, it was the first thing that came to mind when I saw this question. I wrote down other answers, but I can't that's, argue that's so as good. strongly as I could on this one because I I have obviously I've read interviews. They they set out to shoot this like you said, like a thriller to 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 not be a traditional comedy and uh they just put so many little touches in it and uh i love that <sighs> yeah that's a good movie that. they should i think more i hope more comedies will see what they did there and try and emulate that well it's weird because comedies like back in the 80s and i guess early 90s comedies were the big blockbusters and now or at least some of the big blockbusters well, like beverly hills cop like yeah. they would throw all the money at making that look yeah. real yeah and then somewhere along the way it became a hitch where we get all that TV lighting yeah. kind of style. If it's a comedy, this is, and I think it's probably cheaper to shoot that way. It's oh, probably, sure, yeah. Uh, but, man, it, it adds so much more than you think it will mm-hmm. to, in terms of pulling you into that world and helping it feel real and not like a rom-com or something. Yeah, all those effects started going into uh, the comic book movies, basically, mm. right? Yeah. And somehow, I, I know we're talking about Jurassic World too much, but Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom has some of the worst effects from a billion dollar movie I've ever seen in my entire life, mm. especially when you slow it down frame by frame. Can I leave frame. the Mr. Bilson in there? Yes. Okay. Because that's one of my favorite <laughs> things I've ever done. Um, and I won't say anymore. I'm looking uh, forward to this video now. Uh, but Game Night also has that, that quote unquote one shot with the Fabergé egg where they're all running oh, around so throwing great. egg. Yeah. Like they, they went out of their way to take their time and make it look great and it paid off. So yep. That's my answer. Yeah, yep. definitely. It's a great answer. Um, I'm going to go with uh, the Big Lebowski. It's really hard to go against Ooh. Roger D. <laughs> yeah, right. um, uh, one thing that you might forget about the big lebowski is aside from all the you know the the different the different scenes that you you quote and everything there are a lot of fantasy sequences in it too and those are shot incredibly well like yeah. like uh those are just amazing to look at just from a just from a f- sheer photography standpoint oh yeah so like all the scene where like you know he's he's uh you know traveling under all the women's legs and it's, uh, you know and, it's it's pervy but it's in his own dream so whatever yeah, but like, yeah because he's rolling down face down and then he turns up and he starts <laughs> yeah, smiling yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. um there's a scene when he goes to 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 visit um it, it, okay it's jackie treehorn because both big lebowski and boogie nights have names that yeah. like jack horner and jackie yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's jackie treehorn the ben gazara character he goes and you know they're throwing that 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 chick up on the the little trampoline or tarpaulin thing or whatever yeah. and like that whole that so that whole island scene out uh, like dark and just a fire lighting everything and everything beautifully done and even just your normal average comp composed shot looks good i mean it's not like what he does with these fantasy things or whatever but 
man deacons well even so that good. even that uh that credit roll uh when they're they're you know panning across the bowling lane yeah. you see all the people and then it comes to a, another shot that's panning this away and then it's got you know jesus with his <laughs> yeah, with his ball sack yeah yeah it's yeah. oh, so good <laughs> yeah Deacons so. should be the Bill Brasky of cinematographers. Right? Everybody else is in the bar going, Deacons! Deacons. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Roger Deacons yeah. took a camera phone <laughs> yeah. to a set and turned it into goddamn he prob- No Country for No You know what? He probably did. <laughs> he probably did. <laughs> Roger Deacons! <Yeah. laughs> um, I've talked a lot about Scott Pilgrim versus the world, but anytime it's on, like I'll immediately gravitate to it because it's shot unlike anything you've ever seen before and it's hilarious and it's got all the edgar wright isms in there uh it's subversive the, the shot that always kills me is the the jason schwartzman line which is like do you know how long it took me to put those evil exes together like two hours <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, you could almost put any edgar wright movie as an answer for this yeah. right because he's he's making a career out of trying to shoot comedies like action movies and you know um really taking care any of his movies even even though even baby driver which i thought was just okay still shot better than most comedies it really is yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so anyway that i've talked a lot about that before um i put down another answer and i think it's probably not correct because crimes and misdemeanors mm. if you had to categorize it would it be a comedy or a drama Yes. Or a crime throw. Uh, I think it's I think it's both. And in fact, I just clicked on it on IMDb, and that's the two genres they show: comedy, comedy and drama. drama. Uh, yeah, I mean that's it's essentially both. the two sides of the same coin, right? Because the Woody Allen stuff has some drama elements to it, but it's mostly him making fun of of Alan Alda, right? Yeah. And it's it's you know fun and frivolity in Woody Allen. And then the the Martin Landau stuff is all the drama, but it's got some comedic elements too. So. Yeah, it's know. uh, it's it's so uh, Woody Allen used uh, Sven Nykvist for the uh, for cinematography on this one. I was about to ask if it was Haskell Wexler because I think he used Haskell Wexler a lot. Uh, but uh, Nykvist did a bunch of Ingmar Bergman that oh, makes that, makes yep. makes a lot of sense for Woody Allen. Um, and then I I looked up uh, um, I looked up Game Nights guy Barry Peterson. He has a whole bunch of like comedies and stuff like that on it. Nothing shot like hmm. Game Night. That's so, awesome. He probably got a production budget and he was like oh yeah, yeah baby <laughs> yes. finally so it's interesting like you know it's it's interesting how how some of these guys come about uh you know uh, doing the doing the work that they're doing here game night you would think oh that's they probably got some like amazing fucking you know swiss cinematographer or something <laughs> for it and uh no it's this guy he did 21 jump street <laughs> well 21 jump street looks yeah, good too. yeah yeah i mean that say those those are bad they're not game night yeah no all right uh, this one is a little bit long, but I want to give the background coming into it. I'm interested in hosting an event here in Iowa, interesting, uh, for my job that involves showing a film that begs to be discussed afterwards. Uh, I'm not looking for a discussion based on how well a film was made, but choices a character made and the consequences of morality uh, that those movies provide uh, good social commentary. Um, he's compiling a list of films that you wanted to show and wanted to ask the CinemaSins staff for some questions. His examples are, I'm assuming this is a he, uh, are Gone Baby Gone, which we've talked about, Murder on the Orient Express, A Time to Kill, Ex Machina, and a few other things. Well, I did say in my answer, new rule, question askers can only give two examples of answers, because this guy took all the answers to the question. <laughs> or at the very least, Barrett, you should edit the list so that I only see two examples and have plausible deniability <laughs> If I pick something, the question asker has answered. Yes. They're all ones that we've discussed before. Is this heaven? <laughs> no. It's Iowa. Oh. Um, so I, I I thought about this, and I the first one that came to mind was Watchmen. Mm. Uh, now, Watchmen is not... You know, Watchmen owes way more to its source material, I think, than most comic book uh, adaptations do, because obviously uh, all the mo- most, most of your comic book ad- adaptations are based on, you know millions upon millions of volumes why while, while watchman is already sort of a cinematic book mm-hmm. as it is you know so this you know this this goes all the way back to alan moore's uh you know choices and the thing but watchman does have a good uh you know moral dilemma i guess if you're if you're some powerful being that can see that the end of the earth is imminent due to countries that are going to go to war with each other is it maybe possibly a 
good to co- concoct something that kills a whole bunch of people mm-hmm. so that they so that there are still people around and everything you said cock and in- <laughs> did i say cock and you were talking about dr Mid- <laughs> oh yeah i'm such a fucking child my god <laughs> at least it's not me for once <laughs> blue dick <laughs> uh but that has that has that's one of those i mean it's a it's a bigger scale of the uh kill you know was it kill the few to save the many or whatever it is the start the spot yeah stuff. yeah um the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few right the one. I, I, I was i was pointing to you so that you would just go ahead and give me the quote <laughs> and, which i did eventually yes <clears throat> um, um did you read this this comic this graphic novel? I've, I'm ha- I'm, i started reading it a couple of years ago and then i put it down and i haven't been able to get back to it did you ever read it no but it, i am i'm I'm having a weird midlife crisis, and it's it's related to graphic novels. Like I'm buying them by the bushel. Mm. Like I'm trying to read a bunch of them, but also I'm trying to make a really impressive shelf, yeah. So that nice. somebody would come in and go, "Boy, he's read every important graphic novel ever created." <laughs> and so that's one I just haven't read yet. But um, no. it's interesting because I mean, obviously we're gonna spoil the shit out of this, but it's fucking Watchmen, whatever. Because Doctor Manhattan at the end makes he, he, it's a nuclear bomb in the in the movie, right? Or it's, um, it's hydrogen bomb or something, some sort of bomb at the end, right? That kills a bunch of people. Yeah, it's yeah, it's some sort of bomb. And in the in the graphic novel, there's something involving a giant squid. Like he turns into a giant squid that attacks a whole city or something like this. Mm. It's very bizarre. But the the hardcore devoted graphic novel people were like, "Where's the fucking squid?" Yeah. And so I don't know. I, and that it, wasn't even in the extended Snyder cut. <laughs> God damn it! Uh, <laughs> Fucked it all up. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, that, that has a, that has a, a great moral choice, I think. I don't know if I agree with the choice, but, you know, you're talking about, they've set up Dr. Manhattan, especially to be this character who is like Dr. Strange, right? Mm-hmm. Like who can see mm-hmm. every sort of scenario play out before him. And so it makes sense that they would do that. Pe- beings this powerful would decide to do that. It's kind of like when you see movies where the computer decides, I got to kill humanity because I got to save them from themselves. Yeah, you know, that yeah. type of thing. Well, that's the Andy Weir stuff that he was talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I wrote down a few others. X2 is a, t- is a movie that parallels uh, the homosexual, like, uh, like, um, it parallels the, I guess the homosexual experience because there's parents who are like, have you ever, just, you ever thought about not being this and mm-hmm. all that? What, what do normal people like us quote unquote think about the mutants that have this thing that they're born with? You know, do we need to eradicate them? That type of thing. And X2 very much like says, uh no <laughs> right and x2 does it really really well and then they kept doing that same fucking they did. thing over and over and over again in fucking in the the, the last stand they even did it in deadpool 2 with the mm-hmm. whole rehabilitation center and stuff like that yeah so yeah it's weird i can tell you this as somebody who is in the midst of writing a little known series of superhero books mm-hmm. i reached a point in my narrative where i realized i have to have the government become a problem there has Mm. to be a problem but it's been done pretty well a couple different ways Mm -hmm. i found a way to do my own version of this ultimately but it's not easy because if you play out superheroes in real life if you play out like the reality we're in right now sitting in this room if superheroes just showed up tonight on the evening news like how long do you think it would be before trump was like I'm going to create a superhero force, and we're going to put leg irons on all of these and keep... Ta- you know what I'm saying? Oh, like, The government would definitely get involved in that shit. Absolutely. Uh, but X-Men has done it really well. Um, and, you know, the, the Civil War thing is this other angle of, like, we want to have you registered and know your name. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you are telling the story of superheroes in the real world, you will have to confront this. Yeah. Well... So- I've done it myself. Good to know. It's coming soon. Good I've to got know. I've got a few more. I don't I know this is uh you know, I don't want to take up everybody's time. Oh here, no, but dude, I've got dude la- uh, <laughs> listed like fourteen. I uh they I wrote also rope down here. Now rope Ooh. rope may have never been intended to be this way, but you know the theme of what these these two the two central figures who murder their friend uh are saying that they're superior beings that can kill inferior people 
Now, this came out in 1948, hmm. came out three years after World War II. I don't think they were trying to make a parallel with Hitler or anything, but it does sound a lot like it, when, especially hmm. when you look back. The play was written in 1929, so it was well before all of that. But when you, when you look at it with you know 2018 eyes it looks like that kind of a message is being said isn't this the one where they have a dinner party with his fucking casket in there yes God. they 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 their their whole thing is they're going to kill the guy they're going to see if they have a party and not be able to uh let the secret out and and it's and he's on he's in this thing that they put a little tablecloth over and people are like getting their drinks and food off of and everything nice and uh and of course you know because these guys well especially the one guy um can't help but say how superior he is or you know he has too much on his mind about that he let he sort of lets it out of the bag and will hit his friend who's just completely horrified and didn't didn't want to be on in on this in the first place mm. really really just sort of like you know clues james stewart in to the whole thing mm -hmm. uh vertigo is another one that makes you at, makes you think about uh how far can how far are you willing to go morally to find the truth J jimmy stewart is right mm -hmm. in vertigo but he's not right in the way that he does everything that he does yep and that's another one of those things where you have to like the, y yes the truth is important but how we get there is as important it, we mm -hmm. don't want to cause other other problems by trying to find the well truth. it's his character in rear window same thing where, yes. where he's he's doing wrong things to the right end exactly right? Yeah. exactly uh it, that's one of those things that are fascinating about hitchcock movies is that while your characters are right and they are framed in a way that says they're the heroes they're doing shit that's kind of fucked up don't you think that's something that made hitchcock so great that we don't talk about very often is that moral complexity like i feel like he had a really good story picker because mm -hmm. and he doesn't just make one genre of film but his films all have in common the fact that all those people are pretty complex yeah look at yeah. psycho look at janet lee and psycho yeah 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 no i i think he he definitely got that once the i think it was the french new wave guys who came in and because hitchcock did not have that kind of reputation until mm -hmm. french new wave came in and they said look at what hitchcock's doing hitchcock's amazing Let, let's let's start breaking these films down and yes i think over the years he has gotten to that point where we look at his movies as more complex than just thrillers and you know but i mean you can look at them on the surface and enjoy them as yeah. that but when you really think about what some of these characters do a lot of times it's uh it's disturbing mm -hmm. uh and finally i threw down election because election is a movie that goes through this whole thing morals and ethics yep. and everything like that there are so many decisions that characters make in election that just i mean one way or the other changes the entire story mm -hmm. what if chris klein votes for himself what if uh mm -hmm. you know this you know there are lots of little things yeah. that happen so those would be my five those are very uh different types of movies but yeah. i think fits the moral you know the question that he's asking where just characters are making moral decisions it's almost like matthew broderick like accidentally is himself into bad decisions like he just keeps like you know he's a genial good dude and everything and then he makes one bad decision that kind of leads to another one and then another opportunity presents itself and he's like well mm -hmm. you know i've already kind of crossed this line already so yeah, yeah that's i, like I think that. maybe part of the point i think uh by the way you know that girl who plays the daughter in the nice guys who's also in spider-man homecoming yes what is she in Spider-Man Homecoming? One of the friends of the girl that Peter likes. Okay. Um, She's one of the, like, news reporter chicks. Yes. Oh, okay, yes. okay, okay. And she should play young Tracy Flick in the election prequel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Eighth, yeah. Seventh, eighth grade Tracy Flick. <laughs> I think I like that it. would work. <laughs> um, by the way, you were talking earlier about uh, the Watchmen and knowing that they that this race is going to destroy themselves would you would you i was basically explaining to my wife the plot of infinity war yesterday because mm -hmm. she hasn't seen it now forget how we got on this conversation but i was explaining thanos and his motivations she's team thanos all the way oh yeah like but because i i think what it started was she was griping about people too many people on the road or whatever <laughs> yeah. too much development in our town is causing <laughs> traffic moment, and I'm like, I'm like you would like thanos <laughs> she's like why and i was like because he wants to wipe out half Dude. of life because there's two there's not enough resources for him it may it may <clears throat> i'm sure it's it's clear that i am team thanos <laughs> i am i mean yeah as long as we can wipe out 
<laughs> Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm going to talk about this is where I'm going to come back to The Last of Us. This is not a movie. But, okay. Um, and I am I would go ahead and skip ahead about five, ten minutes if you don't want to be spoiled, because I am going to spoil this game for you. Uh, I don't want to because it's awesome if you experience it firsthand, but it's been long enough. Mm -hmm. It's your own fault. Um, so The Last of Us is essentially a story slash mutant zombie game. Uh, and you open, it opens with this, it's kind of like a playable movie where half the time the buttons you're pushing are making choices. Do I go through this door? Do I talk to this person? And then half the time you're pressing buttons to literally club zombies away or throw a glass bottle to make noise so they mm. go check it out and you can sneak away. But it opens with Joel and I think it's his daughter. It's been a few years since I finished the game. Uh, and there's like some kind of outbreak that causes all the zombies and his daughter dies. And then we flash forward like, 13 15 years and he's a lot older and grizzled this would be josh brolin on a perfect day i don't know who they're actually going to cast um and he comes across this uh gal he used to know who wants to wants his help there's this girl 13 14 year old girl named ellie who's been bitten but unlike everybody else who's been bitten she didn't turn into a zombie after two days and so the resistance thinks that her blood might be key to the cure hmm. and so he has to basically shepherd her from boston i think they're in boston to like this headquarters in the Midwest. And that's the game is working your way through this post-apocalyptic world. Sometimes there's puzzles. Sometimes it's action. There's a lot of relationship building between this surrogate father, surrogate daughter, what have you. They get to, to the end where they've reached like the resistance people. And he finds out she does have the, the key to the cure. But when they take it out of her, it's going to kill her. Hmm. Mm. And he rescues her from the facility and leaves. Wow. <laughs> this is how the game ends? Yes. Wow. He chooses wow. to damn humanity because of his love wow. for this girl. Wow. And if you don't come out of that experience wanting to talk about it with somebody, you're not human. <laughs> because that is, and the game has, you've spent all these hours with these characters. You feel that bond, but you also have this moral twinge of, well, you know, she's got to take one for the team, right? Mm -hmm. But he can't. He can't abide it. So this was shocking to you, even, or, or, or did you? This was kind only of expect three years this? ago when I finished the game, and it was only maybe five years ago the game came out. No, meaning is is just shocking when you got to that point in the game. Did you expect him? Did you make that choice, or is that choice made for you? Uh, no, the choice was made for me. But now did, I may have impacted it somewhere along the way and not realized it. Oh, that'd be interesting too. Um, but it didn't. It didn't have that kind of reputation as a game where it was. No, your your endings are changed. That's no. interesting. It is. I'm pretty sure it's a set story, and that is not a choice you make. Hmm. Um, and no, I was not expecting it. I was expecting an emotional. Okay, she's got to die, and he's going to go live on, carrying on her memory, and maybe help another little kid. Wow. Would you have done that? No. You as the character. Well, I mean. That's that's the discussion, right? Mm -hmm. And no, I'm I'm just Casey Affleck from Gone Baby Gone enough that I'm going to follow the rules, and I'm probably going to say, I really think you're great, but I can't let these millions of people die just to keep you alive. Well, that's interesting. Mm. Wow. Anyway, that's exactly wow. the kind of thing this person was asking, and I happened to think of a game before a movie, but it was such an impactful thing for me i wanted yeah. to tell i didn't rather than talking about gone baby gone for the 19th time <laughs> uh you know i thought about like the important movies when i when i first saw this like the saving private ryan where mm. they have to again it's a needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few where they're trying to get this and it's such a i never really bought this premise mm -hmm. that they have to send him home to be with his his mom well it's a pr move the whole the whole thing is is it's not that they normally would do this. Right. It's just that his, was it three of his brothers die? Is it three? I think it's three. Yeah. And I think it was pretty quick succession. Yeah. And I think there was a, I, it may not be a rule. I feel like there was a thing where they, the, the army definitely did not want to let all the children from one family die. Well, it makes a certain amount combat. of sense. But, but that's, that's a, that's like maybe the most tenuous reason that you would go through this whole journey to save one person and would, take them home. I would home. agree. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's an interesting choice that they made. Some of the, the choices made for them. That's their assignment. But there are times where the unit breaks down and they're like, fuck this, man. D d none of them leave. Like the Edward Burns like threatens to leave, right? Like he walks off for a little bit. Yeah. Or yeah, he, he says something. I don't know. I think he does. He's definitely one of the more vocal about. But in the end, they all come thing. together and they're like, hey, if, if one he of us does this, we all do it. Tom Sizemore have a big right. row. 
Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I also thought about uh, 12 Angry Men, which starts with a choice. Mm-hmm. Um, it ends up with a dynamite choice at the end. Uh, boy. I went back and I watched that clip of the uh, what is it, 1947 or something like that, the 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 old one, the yeah, classic yeah. one, um, and that final scene where dude is just yeah, this race is tiring. Talking about the Henry Fonda one yeah. that was like I think that was in the 60s. Oh, uh, maybe so. Um, but yeah, he's just going off on this whole like you know this is uh, the 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 slums and all this stuff. He's obviously super racist and all that, and they start just turning away from him, mm-hmm. and he just breaks down, and it's just it's such a great scene. But my answer is going to be weird. The Adjustment Bureau. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I wasn't expecting to hear the name of that movie. Well, okay. A, you guys don't like this movie, right? Who's in this? Is this Matt this Damon? This is Matt Damon. Damon uh, uh, John Slattery, yeah. Emily Blunt, um, Anthony Mackie. I saw it once. It's, it's, it's a big paranoia thriller. Government well, conspiracy. All, no, no, no. It's, it's about, well, yeah, technically. I mean, this is like... It's a better version of the loom from Wanted, right? Like they they have the uh, the the fate of humanity mapped out, and they see where all the lines are going. If somebody gets devoid of that or, or off that path, their their job as the adjustment bureau is to get them on that path. And the mm-hmm. whole thing is that Matt Damon ends up meeting. He's like a presidential candidate or like a governor candidate or something like that, and uh, he ends up meeting Emily Blunt, and they fall in love, and that screws up the entirety of the timeline going right. forward. And so. They reset it, and then somehow Damon keeps finding his way back to Emily Blunt every time. And they keep trying to, to reset it, and it gets more and more progressively like crazy and Byzantine. And the visual effects are really good, but like the key element of that, of like, this is the way things are supposed to be, and if you fuck that up, then you know, you're going to fuck everything up. Yeah. Um, so it makes a certain amount of sense what Roger, Roger Sterling is doing, what John Slattery is doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then Anthony Mackie's working on the inside to say, like, maybe there's a different way and stuff like that. It's more interesting than you probably remember. And it's actually got pretty good reviews, higher than I thought it was going to be. 7.1 on IMDb, 71% on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. So. Yeah, I mean, that is definitely a movie I saw late at night one one time and and dismissed it almost immediately. It's worth another look. It's 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 an underrated Matt Damon performance, typical great Emily Blunt performance, and uh, very cool. By the way, 12 Angry Men was 1957. <laughs> um, that was off a decade. Of course, we were in between <laughs> it. But, uh, but uh, it was an interesting thing that I, I read one time. I think it might have been Cracked or something like that back in the day when, when you could read Cracked. Yeah, when there uh, were actual articles yeah, on there. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, someone was talking about how like the stuff that Henry Fonda does in 12 Angry Men is not something that you're supposed to be able to do as a jury member, which is to basically introduce new evidence into the um into the record essentially did he introduce i thought i thought he, he like kept bringing back he, like he keeps he keeps bringing up well it could be this or it could be oh, that it's the chick with the glasses it's the yeah. old lady with the glasses is yeah. essentially new evidence because they see her the indentations in her yeah thing. yeah so like it, it's one of those things where it's it's great to come up with they don't they don't actually say whether the decision is right or not by the end of this movie and i will give the movie credit for that and the movie's great by mm-hmm. the way i'm not uh but uh it is one of those things that's interesting like as a juror you can't be like henry fonda in this and be he's the defense attorney basically yeah exactly he's like my cousin Vinny with the glasses (laughs) he's like he's doing that how many fingers i got yeah yeah Yeah, exactly (laughs) what do you think now sweetheart (laughs) (laughs) anyway check out the adjustment bureau too all right oh this is a fun one what is your favorite portrayal of a character in a movie? Doesn't have to be a character that you've known previously. I'm just talking about the favorite movie question to a greater specification. I like the way this is phrased. Yeah. What's your favorite portrayal of a movie character? Yeah, I've got I've got a few here. One we've talked about a bunch, Mark Whitaker, Matt Damon. Oh, the yeah. Yeah. That is just that is just a fully realized comic performance that's amazing. And the way he is is just you know it's he, he we were talking about uh we were talking about uh was it pathological liars in the last episode mm. or whatever he's he's like that too isn't yeah. he he's yeah. i mean he'll he tells some truth but you know it's it's all you know it's always tainted by all this like frame it as him, as him being the hero well it's his hypomania right because he's got bipolar disorder i think so well he even says something about that mm-hmm or i think it's specifically referenced him yeah yeah Yeah. um but yeah it it, it kind of informs that where it's not 
enough to just tell the truth. Well, I there's have a, to, no, there's a point too where he, he's, he's talking about like, how he's the hero and he thinks he's going to be the head of the company by the end mm-hmm. of it. And yeah. Scott Bakula is like, what do you think was going to happen here? You're, you mean you're going to be gone from the company when that this other happened? Lady goes, I think the corporate culture is going to change a little for you moving forward. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, a couple others that I, uh, uh, is John Goodman as Walter Sobchak in the Big Lebowski. He's just such a, just a fucking asshole in this. But you, you're sitting there like you love this guy for whatever reason. He's it's just, his timing. Yeah. It's perfect timing because he'll, he'll start a sentence and then cut it off and be like, dude, what I was going to say, <laughs> shut the fuck up, Donnie. <laughs> yeah, and then he'll start yeah. right back on the transition. Yeah. He, I mean, that's, that is as, that's maybe the best I've ever seen John Goodman. It's yep. a, he's a completely different character for him. Um, and so I really love him in that. And then, I haven't seen Revolutionary Road in forever, but Michael Shannon in that in that movie oh. is so good. He mm. got he got an Oscar nomination, but he's such a he's like you don't. I mean, Michael Shannon is is kind of like this in every movie because he's yeah. got that that sort of that under that seething underbelly of whatever. You don't know what's going to happen with him. That's yeah. how that's how kind of scary he is. But he's you're also don't be don't be afraid to laugh at what he does in revolutionary road even though you think that anything could happen at any moment with him but anyway those are the three that i came up did with. did he win for shape of water no i don't think so so he was now he was nominated for nocturnal animals oh yeah and for revolutionary road wasn't nominated for shape of water was it movie was creamed all over yeah I, it may be because we had seen Michael Shannon play that character before, especially in Boardwalk Empire. That's true. Not a, um, yeah, actually, it's very close to his Boardwalk Empire. Yeah, so um, so that may be the you know like, oh he's he's de- you know he's good. He doesn't he's doing his Michael Shannon. Thing. He actually tore off his own finger for that movie. Like that wasn't that wasn't oh special for effects. real. Yeah. Wow. Just tore it off. That's crazy. Yikes. Fucking Shannon, man. <laughs> his commitment. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Method. <laughs> method core i got two answers i have a lot of this question is fun because i could probably give you 200 different characters i love but i'm going to go with two that are just one, one that's modern and one that's just really super current omar from the wire oh he's oh, it's so good and part of it's the way that uh it's michael kenneth williams yes uh plays the character uh especially that scene where he sits down with bunk the detective and explains yeah. why things are different between them um <clears throat> But the, the show does a great job of building up his mystique. Mm-hmm. Um, Omar coming, y'all. Like the yeah. way that he would walk down the street without a care in the world because everyone was afraid of him. Mm-hmm. And the fact that, spoiler alert, he ends up being taken down by like a kid. Yeah, just a kid in a, in a gas station. Yeah. Um, is perfect for if you like, that's the way it should be poetically from a storytelling perspective. Uh, oh, and, su- and surprise, he's gay. Yeah. yeah. He's a drug he's a he's not even a drug dealer he just steals from other criminals yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's basically his career uh i just loved everything about that character uh was unique and fresh menacing at the right time funny at the right time uh and then the modern super super current one is the the more i steep myself in hamilton the musical uh the, the more i find myself drawn to aaron burr as a character um <clears throat> i just th- feel like the first time i saw it i thought what a great counter for hamilton's character mm-hmm. and the second time i saw it i was like i might agree with him a little more than hamilton in a couple spots at the beginning or towards the more in the beginning the mm-hmm. um and you know i don't know anyway it's just he's he's a much more complex character than i think i gave him credit for at first and i think his motivations are every bit as strong valid and defensible as hamilton's motivations even though they end up on complete opposite sides Mm -hmm. um and i've got that ron chernow book the biography that started it all that oh yeah they wrote this play about and i'm diving into that by the way they could not print words on a page any tinier than they do in this book and this (laughs) book is a thousand pages long if it's two uh but i opened it up and i was like i'm gonna need glasses to read this book it's like it's like that book alone is an advertisement for a kindle (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or like the, or like lens crafters yeah, exactly yeah yeah uh anyway those are my two answers i got a bunch of dude characters and I've, i found them tiring like i i love i wanted to be seth gecko george clooney and from dust till dawn because mm-hmm. he is like the coolest motherfucker mm-hmm. ever the way he talks the way that he interacts just the way he is is fantastic mm-hmm. um but ultimately i kind of found myself drawn to the devil wears prada 
because I think all those characters are perfectly pro- portrayed. Mm-hmm. Like Meryl Streep, obviously, mm-hmm. is perfect as the Anna Wintour type of uh, mm-hmm. character. Anne Hathaway is right in between the whole uh, Princess Diaries and then, you know, her more serious roles down the road. Like, she's she's Anne Hathaway, but more of a realized character version mm-hmm. of it. Emily Blunt is perfect. Mm-hmm. Fucking Stanley Tucci is sure. perfect. Emily, Emily Blunt's announcement to the world was that movie. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's just brought up Emily Blunt in back-to-back questions. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good cast, and they all work well together. Uh, it's It's interesting to see... You know, uh, Stanley Tucci come in and be like, gird your loins, people. (laughs) (laughs) She's coming. There's a lot of background to this, so I'm just going to go right to the question. The question to you is, do you recall a movie that elicited a super emotional moment in a movie that hit you deeply and unexpectedly, especially personally? Um, I've talked about this scene before, but in About Schmidt, the whole Indugu thing is it's got yeah. sort of a thread through it throughout the whole movie where he's just he's he's it's basically pen pals he's uh, he's uh he's uh doing that ten dollars a month thing or yeah, whatever yeah. whatever it is the sally struthers the thing. sally struthers yes. thing and uh and so he he's written letters to this guy and then by the end of it after all the stuff that he's gone through jack nicholson's gone through in this movie he reads the the letter that he that the the nun or whoever has sent back to him and everything and saying like he's doing well thanks a lot for a lot due to what your help and everything he's a great student he's all this other stuff him looking up at that letter and just crying mm. like hits me every time i think about it mm. that's uh, the first time he gets a letter from him right i think so or the I think, only time i think right? it's the only time and, yeah. and it would and that makes sense too because if he had gotten letters all throughout then that wouldn't have nearly the impact. Right, because he's his whole thing is dear in Google. Dear in Google. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that always hits me because he's reading that and, and he's he's kind of been this awful character all the way through it and everything, but that he finally gets something at the end that mm-hmm. shows I've made an impact. Um I you know, and and it's finally broken him after all this this long journey he's had and everything it's not just the letter it's everything else too but uh love that moment yeah. in about schmidt and i also brought up and this doesn't hit me as much but it does hit me emotionally um the edward norton character in american history x mm-hmm. um he's he's grown up in this family where like there's been a lot of coded language for a while there They're talking about you know um the first thing first time he starts hearing racist language is with his dad talking mm-hmm. about um it's when you when you consider other people for jobs that normally wouldn't get the oh affirmative action affirmative action yeah. mm-hmm. he's talking about affirmative action he calls it affirmative black action right and they're growing that they, when they when these kids are growing up he and edward furlong are growing up and like you know i don't think they have this sense that they're racist yet or they they hate black people or anything but they start hearing these type of things mm-hmm. and they're like oh well my dad didn't get a job because of this and then so you see how edward norton's character turns into this like you know super nazi skinhead racist guy and his culmination into you know stomping dude on the curb Mm -hmm. and all this other type of stuff he goes into jail and he immediately has a friend a a black friend in the laundry that helps him out later on in a huge way Mm -hmm. and it just completely turns him around meanwhile edward furlong's character is going down the same path that edward norton's was before he went to jail and everything and there's that whole thing where norton is like he's like i just came i wanted to talk to you because you know what i'm tired of being pissed off all the time i'm tired of doing all you know blah. that scene is so good when he's talking to his brother mm-hmm. like that that whole time just talking about you know i'm just tired of being pissed off all the time it's time to stop blaming everybody else for your problems go out and do your own thing yeah you know it's interesting because i i find it hard to go back to that movie mm-hmm. but every time i watch it aside from the the I yeah, even you hate can't, saying you, curb stomping. Yeah, like, you can't. I mean, yeah, it's one of the most awful things yeah, in a film. But it's aside not even from graphic. that, it's so, it's so great. It's such a great journey, and it's really well done. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really need to go back and, and check that out again, because mm-hmm. that journey is really, really cool. I was trying to look up to see what his friend, who his friend was uh, in prison. Was it Guy Tory? Lamont? That, that sounds right. Um, that sounds right. He, 
He kind of has the same mannerisms of Dave Chappelle. You don't have to thank me for nothing, all right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that's great. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go with About Time. Um, Which I still need to see. I want. I actually, <sighs> when you mentioned it a few weeks ago, I was like, okay, I'll I'll watch this, but uh there wasn't there weren't any free ones <laughs> i think i've talked about this before i sometimes have, sometimes i sometimes i don't mind paying some money to watch a movie but when a movie that's regularly apparently playing on cable and everything and it's like 2.99 i'm like fuck you <laughs> 2.99 fuck that i'm the same way i think if you watch this movie once you could be fooled into thinking it's a romantic dramedy about Donald Gleason and Rachel McAdams, mm. but it's not. I think it's a father-son movie about Bill Nye and Donald Gleason. The movie starts. I've, I've talked about this movie before. Uh, the father basically explains, "Hey, the men in our family can time travel. Um, <clears throat> you know, don't tell anybody." And he basically uses it for the most part to try and get with Rachel McAdams because they had this meet cute. They go to one of those restaurants that's pitch black. Oh, yeah. there's no light. Uh-huh. And yeah. so they flirt vocally because they're the next table over from each other. And then for whatever reasons, movie conspiracies, they don't actually meet physically. And He's trying to get back and recreate that moment, but he has to help his friend and he goes back in time to help his friend. And that ruins his chance to meet this girl. And now he's got to figure out how do I meet this girl? But he remembers that she really loves Giselle. I think it's Giselle. <laughs> it's a, some supermodel. Giselle, Giselle Bungeon. Bungeon. Some supermodel. <laughs> And there's a show, an art show with her prince or whatever. And so he goes there and sits and waits until Rachel McAdams shows up um, and talks to her. Falls in love, get married, babies, yada, yada. The point of telling you this whole movie is that at the very end, um, he knows that once he has a kid, he can't go back in time to before that kid or it'll change the kid. And his dad has already died. Hmm. So he's going back to visit his dad. But then his wife decides she wants to have another kid. Mm -hmm. And so they try, they get pregnant. And then he basically has one last back in time trip to visit his dad to say, this is it. Like, mm -hmm. she's having the baby today. And the dad, Bill Nye is so great in this movie. This is, this is either the dad. I don't know if this dad is real or not. I think he is. And it's just not my dad. <laughs> but like when he gives the toast at his son's wedding, it's like the most eloquent Tom Hanks winning an Oscar thing that makes you just feel warmth and love. And he's so happy for his son who's about to have a baby instead of being sad that their time together is coming to an end. And he d he says, there is one thing I'd like to do. And the music swells. Of course, this is all piano riff on Ben Folds, The Lucky One. Um, so the score of the whole movie is sounds oh, like Ben luckiest? Folds is just playing yeah. melancholy. And it swells and it cuts. And it's Donald Gleason as a five-year-old on the beach with Bill Nye run, just running along the beach. Hmm. And it it almost broke me just then. It breaks me every time because that is not the relationship I have with my father. Hmm. Um, I don't want to get all woe is me. My father loves me. I love him. We say it freely. Um, but that may be about where our similarities end. Hmm. Uh, we're very different people. Uh, and the idea that a father's last wish would be to go re-experience running along the beach with his son. It's not a thing I can relate to, mm. but it is a thing I would love to be able to relate to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have seen that movie four times and I am in tears at the end of it every single time. I can imagine. Every single time. I've got weird moments because, you know, I'm, I'm around the house a lot, so I hang out with, with the kid just by proxy but i don't spend a lot of like quality time with him probably not enough and the other day he was right outside my office and he was just talking he was talking to my wife and i'm gonna fucking lose it on this he was just talking about and I, like i thought about his voice his voice hasn't changed yet mm. he's still got those youthful mannerisms and stuff like that and i just went out and like gave him a big hug i was like mm. i love yeah. hearing your voice yeah oh, fucking cry. Yeah. speaking of crying mm -hmm. are you done i'm sorry <laughs> i'm done go ahead speaking of crying uh i still have programmed in me the macho masculine thing where you're not supposed to cry in mm -hmm. front of another dude mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. had chris not been at that screening of black klansman uh which is what this guy actually cited as his example mm -hmm. uh i would be bawling mm. i was like i was i was 
composing myself so as not to look like a weepy bastard in mm-hmm. front of a, a fellow male. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would have fucking lost it. Hmm. A the, man of my gender. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've talked. We didn't do a mini pod with it. We just did like a yeah, within the, the yeah. pod type of thing. Incepti pod. The way that uh, that they tie that in to the 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 modern era yeah. at the end is just heartbreaking. And when you see the Charlottesville stuff in a different context, mm-hmm. out of context of the news where everything is more antiseptic and stuff like that, it it'll, it'll kill you. That's not my my real answer because that was that was his pick. My real answer is a movie I've been watching the crap out of lately: Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Ah. Mm. So I. Yeah, I was on the record as not really, really loving this movie when it first came out. Like mm-hmm. I was I enjoyed it, and uh, the visuals were great, and everything. The more I watched this, I I did pick up on these themes when I first watched it. Like you know, what is reality? What makes something you know sentient? What uh, what is a soul? What is you know that kind of thing? Mm-hmm. And the more you watch this, the more it brings out how much they really explore that through in different levels. You've got the the offspring of the 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 two replicants if you fully subscribe that deckard is a replicant is that person a person or mm-hmm. is that a replicant and that's where Kay says you know i've never retired somebody that was born before you know i don't know if to be born is to have a soul and then you've got the joy character which is completely holographic essentially but she has so much dramatic weight on that and then you know you've got Kay himself as a replicant he doesn't even consider himself to be worthy of anything until he gets mixed up in this stuff and it ends up being a more emotional movie the more that you watch it, the more that you think about things like that. Like, mm-hmm. Man, you know, and especially that ending was a little sterile to me because it lasts so long. Um, the first time I watched it, but it it gets progressively more emotional the more mm-hmm. that you do that. And it's got that kind of a play on the teardrops in the rain because he's got the snow falling on him yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Anyway, you know who's pretty? What? I was just playing that, bringing that game up again. Now, Anna, speaking uh, of Blade Runner 2049, you know who's pretty? Anna de Armas. Oh, I was going to say Mackenzie Davis, but they're yeah, both, both pretty. Oh, my God. <laughs> Especially the merged form? Yeah, my God. <laughs> That's it's actually like, pretty freaky. It's like, it's like Ryan Gosling, you lucky motherfucker. <laughs> he got to have a threesome with two yeah, of the most amazing actresses. Man. This will be like a little uh, respite from the very emotional indeed. Question for the podcast. What do you guys think about Henry Cavill and Ben Affleck quitting the DCEU with the caveat that as of... Uh, as of October 4th, they haven't technically finalized that they're leaving, but everybody kind of assumes that they're leaving, it's, right? uh, Well, it's been rumored that Affleck's on his way out for, a, well, almost before Justice League, even. I think that was a rumor. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, and it big, big rumors a week or so ago about Henry Cavill out as Superman. It was reported as news, and then Warner Brothers' studio came out and basically non-denial denial that basically said, we're still working with Henry on superman moving forward blah 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 blah. but it's still one of those things where it sounds like he may be under contract for another one and he's negotiating how to get Mm -hmm. out of it um so understanding they both they both might end up keeping the roles invalidating this question um do you really see that happening though i suppose it could i were if i were any of those actors i would be (laughs) bailing ship hard. except for maybe gal gadot maybe gal yeah. gadot but again they need to do they have so much more to do to demonstrate that they're headed in the right direction so that even the names we're going to throw out here because a lot of people have thrown out michael b jordan would be a great superman and i totally agree with that um <clears throat> but you know he's probably a little smarter than to jump into the dceu right mm-hmm. now at least until like it's going to take i think it's going to take two to four films that are good to great before people start flocking to those roles again you got you're gonna have to drop down a tier now uh from the a list to the b list mm-hmm. i think um but honestly what i wrote in my answer uh is that the only the only thing they've got left that could make po- potentially make this work is that flashpoint um which they're apparently intending to tell the flashpoint story from the comics and the animated movie that we send mm-hmm. with ezra miller's flash character the flashpoint is where they reset essentially he, the timeline. Yeah, he basically right? ends up in an alternate dimension where Batman is Bruce Wayne's father mm-hmm. uh, because Bruce Wayne died in the alley, not his dad. Uh, but everybody else is also different. That's the only way this works, right? Otherwise, you really have to. It's like a baseball team. You have to tear down and rebuild from scratch. Well, I mean, look at you know the differences between the Nolan Batman and the and the Tim Burton Batman and stuff like that. You you technically do. 
but you'd be resetting the whole extended universe, and you don't want to lose that space race officially to Marvel, right? You've you just, already lost. Yeah, it's so no, I know, but to me, you should. If you're trying to race Marvel, you should just throw a throw the white flag out. Yep, <laughs> because they they beat you in ten years ago. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody would bat an eye if they just decided to walk back into Warner Brothers for three years, decide not to make any more movies, and then just come back with new shit. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody would bat an eye at that. It might suck for, you know, you know, Wonder Woman, which was the only big thing that happened. He might, you know, he might not get Gal Gadot anymore. He might have to, you might have to, you know, recast that, which is, you know, that's. I don't I don't know if you're going to start over you're going to have to probably. Well it depends on how many of these you're you're hoping to get involved. I but mean you Aquaman could write, is going to You could write a story that is the Flashpoint adaptation that sees both Ezra Miller and Gal Gadot together mm -hmm. going into an alternate universe. And boom, now we have new Batman, we have new Aquaman, we have new... You see what I'm saying? No, I do. I'm like, saying that you, I don't even know if you have to go to those links. And I think that's what you're saying too is just basically reset it everybody knows that you're but, then, but that but they're not going to do that though they're not going to take three years off because those decisions are being made by stockholders not yeah. creative directors and so there will be a flash movie there will be another batman movie there will be another superman movie there will be another justice league movie mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is you know, it's they're not going to take the break that they should creatively and so if they're going to keep plotting forward as they are I think the only salvation is the Flash. You've got to go hard into Flashpoint. Yeah. I can't find a single, like, ultimately redeemable thing besides Wonder Woman. And like you said, the the, the sheen is starting to wear off a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I think the message and the themes are more are better than the I actual mean, the, movie. The only other option is clear the slate and let Matt Reeves, the Batman, be the kickoff of the next whatever the DCEU is going to be. Because I feel like you've got... That's the only one that feels like it's headed in a good direction mm -hmm. in terms of the, what he said about how he wants to treat the character, how he wants to shoot the thing. Um, he's got a script that he's submitted already that they apparently really liked. Um, so maybe you recast Batman there and you start anew. And, yep. But it's just a fucking mess. It's a fucking mess. It really is. Is anyone excited about the Joker movie, the uh, Todd Phillips one? Actually, a lot of people are. No, I mean, in this room um no <laughs> no not until i see something exactly that's the thing is that it frustrates me how many people are willing to make or break their opinion early on from a look yeah and from it's a, a fine look. look it looks okay yeah i wasn't gonna make or break jared leto's joker on the look right. but plenty of people were out just from the way he looked i'm like that's that's not the point the point is the performance and that's we we'll have to wait to see that and it's gonna have to be better than ledger for me to care about this movie yeah and, and I just don't know. I mean, you definitely cast the right guy. If there's anybody alive that that can come up with some new way to do a Joker that's visceral and exciting, it's probably Phoenix. But I'm not interested. Not yeah. until a, a lot of people tell me it's rad. <laughs> Specifically <Yeah>. rad. <laughs> yeah. Not good. <laughs> oh, this will be fun. Hey, let's, let's uh, switch it up and talk about some music real quick. Uh, specifically movie soundtracks. What is your favorite single that was recorded specifically for a movie soundtrack? Lately... This person has, interestingly enough, been into Gary Clark Jr. and Junkie XL's version of Come Together that was done for Justice League. Fine. Yeah. Fine, fine cover. Yeah. I don't know if this is my favorite or not, but this is a, uh, it's interesting how you discover music when you're a movie theater projectionist mm. a lot of time. So The Odd Life of Timothy Green, which is a movie I have never seen, by hmm. the way. I know the know the story of it because it's like Jennifer Garner and uh, Joel Edgerton oh, need a yeah, kid. Yeah. They want a kid and they grow something out in the garden. It turns out to be a kid. Little boy something tree. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, and I remember we because we were in the digital age when this movie came out. And every digital movie comes with a little piece of paper in it that tells you the aspect ratio and all this other stuff. Also tells you when you should put your light cue on so you put in the computer it's oh it's an hour and 45 minutes and 37 seconds light should come up so uh did this with on life of timothy green uh the i guess it was the first day that i came back like i usually didn't work work fridays and of course nobody on friday would ever fix this shit mm. so saturday came in first show ran through didn't hear anything about it 
until like somebody came out and said yeah lights came up like towards the end of that movie or whatever and uh so then you have to wait for the next show to see where the lights actually come up and everything mm-hmm. and then you have to figure out where the credits actually start <laughs> all that so i walked in there and and i was like oh shit this fucking lights come up like five minutes before the movie's over hmm. so i i did that but i you know i was sitting there playing around with it and there's a song that plays it's from glenn hansard who um a lot of people might know from once the movie once did oh a, yeah, yeah, yeah did a did a song called falling slowly i believe was mm-hmm. the was the oscar winning right. song from that from that movie he did a, he did a, a song called this gift which is really sort of just an emotional like you know it Some people might even think it's a syrupy ballad type of thing or whatever, but I love this song. Hmm. I'll sing this shit in the shower. When you guys finally come around to listening to this and hearing this, you're going to be like, Chris, the fuck? What's wrong with you? (laughs) But this is one of those type of songs. I love it. I just love it. I love Glenn Hansard's voice in this whole thing, and it's just a good song overall. A movie I've never seen before. That's crazy. And (laughs) it's just in the credits. Um, So that's one of them. Um, I also like the the Fru Fru's let let go the from Garden State. Oh uh, yeah, was in the trailer prominently, but I believe it's the credit music in yes. Garden State. Yes, uh, is I love that. And it, when I first heard it, I thought it was like Death Cab or it was um, the uh, the Postal Service. Well, yeah, because there's there's this weird like overlap of like the shins covering the postal service in that soundtrack <laughs> yeah. and then like you know frou-frous and all this kind of sound similar and all that yeah, yeah yeah but uh i like those two songs that's it that's all the songs that i like <laughs> i was really hoping that you would say the end is the beginning is the end well yeah i i considered that yeah for sure um i couldn't i don't know during the time that i was answering this question I was trying to figure out if that had actually been written for Batman Forever. I could have looked it up, I guess. But. Uh, I don't know if it was or not. It's crazy because we went to to see Smashing Pumpkins. They played like four soundtrack songs. Yeah. <laughs> like they played Lost the Highway. one from Lost Highway, I. They played the uh, the end is the beginning and is the end. And uh, they played Drown from Singles and uh, one other one. Uh, but yeah, it was crazy, man. They played a lot of fucking songs. you when you drown. Yeah. <laughs> yes uh, um i really think lose yourself is the right answer here in terms mm. of the best single ever recorded specifically for a movie yep mm. um in addition to a candidate for greatest song ever recorded <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it won the oscar but for, I want, for best movie ever <laughs> but i wanted to i wanted to pick a different because people i think are already aware that i love that song and that i love eminem and i like that movie uh, so i'm gonna go with believe from prince of egypt um, which is Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey. Oh, and we are not properly thankful enough for this song in society. This is before both of them went off their own rails in different directions. Yeah. Um, this is when both of them still cared more about singing well than anything else. And it has potential. Now, there are some runs here and there, but you would think this has the potential to be like a sing off, like try and outdo each other. But the final note, you will win, you believe. They're both just, they just hold that note for a good two, three, so restrained mm. and harmonizing. And then, of course, for the last 30 seconds of the song, they take turns doing, ooh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> but it is a great song. The soundtrack to that whole movie is outstanding. Um, it's just this overlooked thing. I'm not sure why. It's a great film. Maybe it was just a little too Bible heavy. I'm not sure. Uh, I got to check that. Voice that, acting's I don't great. Know if I've heard that. That song won the Oscar, by the way. That wow. song won the Oscar. Yeah. And I remember them performing it at the Oscar ceremony. Mm-hmm. And even that live performance is great. Um, but fantastic song. Imagine that. Imagine having the balls to go, what if we asked Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston to do a duet? And you weren't laughed out of the room. Well, this like, was 98, 99? Somewhere, somewhere around in there. Yeah, well, right? Mariah Carey already had that. Uh, people compared her to Whitney Houston as soon as she came. Uh, she she first hit the scene and everything. Yep. So that was a big moment yep. for them to be singing together in one song and everything. Steven Schwartz won the Oscar, by the way, for that song. It would be like today, John Legend and Ariana Grande singing a song together. <sighs> I'm kidding. You know it what it is? Like it's, it'd be momentous. It's it's the anti Lady Marmalade. It really is. Because uh, you you remember like uh, Pink and uh, Christina Aguilera got into like a big feud over that. Did they really? Because they both wanted to back clean up, 
the last verse where it's like, uh, and I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Who got it? Christina got it, right? Christina got it. You sounded like a trucker doing a Christina impression. <laughs> I don't know. It's like Adam Sandler doing Christina. I, go, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Somebody do. <laughs> no, yeah, because they both have like, of the, the ones, it was Maya, it was uh, Lil' Kim for some reason. Yeah. Missy Elliott. Missy Elliott, again, for some reason, and Pink and Christina, and they had by far the strongest voices. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Christina got got her diva hackles up. I, see, I, I'm not, that doesn't surprise muscled me. Muscled her out. That doesn't surprise me. Um, I think probably, and I, I should have checked this beforehand, I'm pretty sure that Mrs. Robinson was written for The Graduate. I think so. Yeah, I think you're right. um, And I would say that that's probably the best song. I think, in fact, the Simon and Garfunkel album is The Graduate. I was going to say, I think yeah. there were multiple songs for yeah. that movie. You know, that's got to be up there. I've always mentioned the single soundtrack. Um, they did use some music that was already written, but then they wrote, they, they used a lot of stuff that was written specifically for that. The, the Chris Cornell uh, song. The uh, the Smashing Pumpkins song, a couple of the um, uh, the Pearl Jam songs were recorded during the ten sessions, but then they wanted to to give it to that because they were. And that's pay. why this question some can be hard because there are songs that you remember, like Lady Marmalade, which yeah. obviously wasn't written for Moulin Rouge. It was a song that iteration was for Moulin. Yeah, Rouge. that yeah. iteration was, but the original song wasn't um and there were a lot of stuff like that that i kept running into i was like well about that oh well that was a that was just a cover of uh this song or whatever mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you hear another song and you're like i don't know if that was actually written especially for that soundtrack you know who knows we may have come up with answers today that were that were off but. well i'll tell you what was written specifically for and the movies were built around this thin premise is heartbreak hotel jailhouse rock oh man yeah. all those fucking elvis presley hits that were somehow turned into entire movies right uh based on oh is he gonna play it is he gonna play it? oh it's jail rock mm -hmm. um and then i have to say essentially all of the oh brother where are the soundtrack but particularly man of constant sorrow yeah because that's that's a narrative thread through that uh you've got the the soggy bottom boys i are they how are they credited on that album i wonder or is it is it individually it's dantamensky and like all the the uh, different I'll artists that up, but um yeah i don't know but obviously they performed as the soggy bottom boys and you know that that's that kicks the whole movie up into a whole different notch because otherwise they're just on this hero's journey essentially yeah um but then they, they've got this other thing this way out this parallel universe and and a uh, man of constant sorrow is not originally written for oh brother we're not them it was a song first published by dick burnett uh original song was originally called farewell song in a songbook by burnett dated to around 1913 that's amazing so that's like how far back some of these songs go sometimes well it's um, interesting the the ralph stanley song the oh death song mm -hmm. He was, I believe, 83. He was in his 80s when he performed that. And you can hear just the wear and tear of his his voice and his life into that whole thing. And when he goes, oh, oh, oh he really like hits those. Up. It's like those Johnny Cash covers, right? Where he's like, he's almost, all I can do is speak. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> the opposite of that. Because Ralph, man, he goes up there. He, he nails those things. And I believe he wrote that quite a while ago, too. Uh, but performed it in his 80s for for the soundtrack. Yeah, even this song was even written, uh, well, it was supposed to be, producer T-Bone Burnett had previously suggested the Stanley Brothers recording as a song for the dude in the Coen Brothers film The Big Lebowski, but it did not make the cut. Uh, so for their next collaboration, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, he realized that the song would suit the main character as well. I uh, believe Tominsky is uh, credited with Harley Allen and Pat Enright. Oh, okay. So yeah so good i can listen to that probably five times in a row and not get sick of it oh yeah matter of great. fact you, you essentially do in the movie like you yeah you hear the recorded it's version just like, and it's, it, it's just like uh um that thing you do right yeah the, yeah, they, yeah exactly. play that a million yeah. times uh i do like this question i'm going to shorten it a little bit which actor or actress do you think are really good but aren't in enough movies for this person it's paul dano um he knows he's directing a movie now but man he's such a great actor i agree with that i think we've got some good answers for this yeah um i'm gonna go with deborah winger now uh, a lot of a lot of people will instantly know once i say deborah winger debbie wings the reason why she's not in a lot of movies <laughs> is because she was considered difficult and all this other stuff it was her and sean young were like in that that yeah. kind of contemporaries although right? yeah although she, you could almost say 
uh, Sean Young was verifiably insane. Yeah, at, that's true. At times yep. because there were just things that she did. But but Deborah Winger, like I was going through her IMDb, and so many times there was somebody who wrote in the trivia uh, was offered this part, turned it down. It was all, and these are all like huge parts too. Wow. Like was offered this part and turned it down. Apparently she didn't like Richard Gere very much on an officer and a gentleman. And she didn't like Shirley MacLaine in terms of endearment. Mm -hmm. She didn't like her at all. So there's a lot of like that type of thing. She apparently has standards that are hard to, hard to, hard to meet yeah. in, a, in a, in a whatever. But you know, you look at it, 47 total credits on the IMDb. Mm. Uh, and she's good. She's really good. Like she was nominated for terms of endearment. I think she won for terms of endearment. And she was nominated for uh, Shadowlands, the C.S. Lewis uh, uh, movie. Um, but uh, anytime you ever see Deborah Winger, she's awesome. Yeah, uh, it's just that she had, you know, and she's. I think she's recently been. Was it The Ranch? I think she's yeah. on the net. I guess net. that's still running. Yeah, still running. Uh, that's been her latest thing. She's in like fifty episodes of The Ranch, but. Uh, that's a sad uh, state of affairs for me to think that uh, she's just doing that and not, you know, she's not in movies, just stealing scenes and stuff mm -hmm. from everybody. So that's who I who I pick. Good pick. Choice. Uh, both both my picks. I think it's possible just decided to walk away from acting, mm -hmm. which does happen. Uh, but I'm going with Bridget Fonda, who hasn't made a movie since 2002. I know why. 2002. Why? Uh, Bridget Fon Bridget Fonda married Danny Elfman. And then ha decided to be a homebody. Really? So she did choose to stop acting. Yes, because she was great. Yeah, she, she was, great was right up until the end, and then just poof. Yep, she's gone. She married. Aww. She married Danny Elfman. Had kids, and uh, has. Just... I bet that's a fun household. I bet it is. Because she is delightful, and he's fucking Danny fucking. Well, Kelvin. I know yeah. my other name did not marry Danny Elfman, <laughs> but it's Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Oh yeah. Um, who well, again? I mean, they only dated. <laughs> may have he may have chosen to walk away from acting like the okay so for instance the guy that played king joffrey on game of thrones announced before he was done on that show that he was going to walk away from acting uh, and he has and he's pursued other careers so that that happens but jonathan taylor thomas has shown up here and there on last man standing tim allen's current sitcom but otherwise hasn't really been anything in about 13 years mm. he was the only kid on home improvement that ever had any actual acting talent that, that, that older kid was a fucking lunkhead, man. I'm sorry. Poor guy. He got Tokyo <laughs> Drift. He got that little cameo there. By the way, another thing I did not realize about Bridget Fonda was that she had a car crash, a serious car crash in 2003, caused a fracture in her vertebra. Oh. Uh, in March of the same year, became engaged to Danny Elfman, and they have one son named Oliver So, uh, So it could have been a combination of things that uh, she decided not to continue acting hmm. but i just felt like they were both talented and both certainly not oh too old to keep working bridget fonda's the shit man yeah. I, everything that i ever saw her in except for road to wellville um, <laughs> uh i i i fell in love with her point of no return which is the la femme nikita remake which is really i mean i thought she's great in that obviously jackie brown mm -hmm. um uh really and singles and uh, yeah. i really just dig bridget fonda really really like her how old is she uh she's probably 50 54 hmm she's 54 wow so she's uh, she said 15 years ago is when she officially stopped wow yeah, her last her last movie was uh, a TV movie called Snow Queen, and she was in Kiss of the Dragon before that, the Jet Li movie. Oh yeah, oh I remember that. Uh, what do you like about Jonathan Taylor Thomas? Are you th thinking about the Home Improvement? He's talented. He's he's charming. Did you uh, like? He made that movie about the wildlife photographer and his brothers. He made that Home for Christmas movie. Yeah. Was They're, that um, Wild America that you're talking Wild about? Wild America. Yeah. He was always good in all that stuff. He was always better. But he than was a he was the a, stuff he was he in. was a teen beat. He was kid. That was the thing. Like, like when I hear mm. when I I actually did think you were joking when you wrote down Jonathan Taylor That's Thomas funny. because because I was like I, I I can see him being good. It's just that it, he had a very like particular career in the nineties, and it was mainly being on Teen Beat magazines. And then well, like and then like I never really. I mean, yeah, he's good in uh, Wild America and stuff like that, but I just never thought of. He's the only one I ever felt was destined for greater things than a sitcom. Um, and again, my this pop, part of the reason for this is probably my wife's loves Home Improvement, so she watches those reruns like I watch Friends. Mm -hmm. And you see, baby Jonathan Taylor Thomas, and 
he's as good an actor as grown up Tim Allen is. Dear, <laughs> dear baby Jonathan Taylor Thompson. <laughs> dear baby John. <laughs> I like to think of Jesus as an angry badger. Um, <laughs> and I just felt like he was always the whereas the other two, Mark and Brian, whatever their fucking names were, yeah, yeah. they they were not uh, they were not actors. Mm. They were just cute kids. Yeah. Whereas he always seemed like an actor. Uh, his older brother was in Tokyo Drift, know, and I, he was fucking excellent as as a very shitty acting bully. He's, yeah, he's, he's, the, bell, the bully was bad. I mean, the bully I was mean, bad. when I look back at it now, I I can see that. Yeah. He's in another one too. He's in another movie as a bully. I saw. Yeah, him. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I can't think of what it fist is. fight. Yeah, it's fist fight. Uh, so Thomas Hayden Church is my pick. Ooh. All right. I always thought he was criminally underused. Now he's yeah. done a lot of voice work, obviously, because he's got that yeah, great he's got force. That voice. Yeah. Uh, but he's been legitimately excellent in two movies by my count. Uh, he was on Wings too. And yeah, I, I was a, about I to say. Nice that's where everybody, wings. everybody first uh, got. Well, yeah, he's this dim-witted mm. uh, mechanic. Yeah, and uh, when you see him in Sideways, uh, which was my first exposure to him as an actual serious yeah. actor, even in a comedic role, uh, ultimately yeah, comedic he's so role. So good in that. Mm-hmm. That's just he's 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 perfect in that movie. He's every bit. As nuanced as Paul Giamatti's character is. <laughs> mm-hmm. Miles, what you need to do is have your joint worked on. <laughs> <laughs> He's just talk about a dude that just makes serial bad decisions. Yeah. Yep. And again, another Alexander Payne thing where like, he just can't help himself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, he runs home naked from like the... You know, when the boyfriend catches him, he's like, I lost my wallet. I can't lose it. It's yeah, yeah. so fucking great. And I think he's legitimately great in Easy A. Yeah, he yeah. is. Um, we've had that classic, like, relatable teach type of thing. He almost set a template for Woody Harrelson's character in 17. Edge of 17. Edge of 17. I almost said 17 again. But yeah, where, where it's like a cool teacher, a relatable teacher. He's actually teaching, but he's not inappropriate. He's not over the line. Um, he's got character traits basically and i don't think people give him the credit that he deserves i don't think he has enough serious work that's on that level i don't mm-hmm. think for what it's worth thomas hayden church has got 66 credits mm-hmm. on the imdb and paul dano has 32 ah so i mean it depends on what your you know definition is do you do, are they i mean we'd have to look at all the ones they're in too like they could be in a lot of ton of like you know straight to video type no movies. i looked at it there's a there's a lot of stuff that i didn't real that i didn't recognized and then there's a lot of voice work and stuff mm, like that yeah. so the movies that he's been in yeah i mean he directed that uh that one that we talked about recently and uh, he was in like smart people he was in obviously spider-man 3 he's not bad in spider-man 3 but spider-man 3 is bad yeah um you know he's been in a lot of stuff he was in idiocracy for a second we bought a jew <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna say John Carter next. <laughs> Holy shit! Oh my god! <laughs> the wrongest i've ever been accidentally <laughs> oh my god mm. <laughs> well everybody knows it was a mistake right yeah. you caught it immediately it doesn't sound like i don't know i mean i guess there's people out there who are like what kind of freudian slip is that shit well when i was on the radio in college it was a christian station and one time Instead of peace in the midst of the storm, I announced a song as piss in the midst of the storm. Nah. <laughs> and you can't, I couldn't take that back, but nobody judged me. Everybody knew it was a mistake. You make the final call on that. Uh, one. We'll see. Yep. <laughs> Jesus oh, Christ. Oh, fuck. That was awesome. Uh, we probably got time for one, maybe one, one more quick one. Maybe one more. Yeah, hey, boo-boo. Hey, Barry, Chris, and Jeremy, I had a quick question about habits based on movies. Whenever I call my mother, she calls me. We both start the call off with a Mrs. Doubtfire drown out, drawn out, hello, which is, I guess is very similar to mm-hmm. the Seinfeld one that we always quote. Um, my question is this. What weird habits or quotes or ways of speaking have you picked up from the different movies that you watch? Thank you for making Mondays a draw. You're very welcome. And this is a fastball right down the middle of the fucking plate for us. Yeah, oh. dude. Uh me and a co-worker at uh, Hollywood 27 used to 
when we would complain about our you know our theater and the company that ran it and all this other type of stuff inevitably would get into some very glenn gary glenn ross type of dialogue and usually the one the phrase that was used over and over and it's used over and over and ed it would by ed harris is bunch of fucking nonsense yeah. <laughs> it's a bunch of fucking nonsense treat people like that um and so yeah there's a point there's a point in there ed harris he may only say it like three or four times but it's, it seems like there's more. he does say it a lot but uh but yeah we that is something that even to this day if something is bunch of fucking nonsense i'm gonna say it like <laughs> ed harris does in glenn gary glenn ross not to mention that whole fucking movie i could get it we could do in the one of those things where you know you just name starts start with a line and i would just start going off and i think we were in an uber in la or new york or something like that and somebody jeremy asked me or i asked jeremy like have you made your decision oh, <laughs> in, yeah. the, in front of this uber driver completely oblivious. have you made your decision for christ yeah exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh, sorry, poor guy. Yeah. Oh man. I mean, yeah. Sometimes you know you're you know you're visiting the the cancer kids, and you're like, you need brass balls to sell real estate. <laughs> <laughs> cancer kids. <laughs> um, uh, so my wife and I regularly quote "Liar, Liar." It's one of the first movies we loved together. Oh, mm-hmm. nice. And anytime anybody says, and she does this regularly, if she's just telling me about what she's going to do today, she says, then what I'm going to do, and I'll always bust in and go, what I'm going to do is piss and moan like an impotent jerk and bend over and take it up the tailpipe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, You've been here before. <laughs> but another one I do is uh, Princess Bride, because I never, I never wanted to say to my wife, good night, I'll most likely kill you in the morning, because I don't, <laughs> I don't want to say things like that even for joking yeah. so i use the other one i say sleep well and dream of large women nice. Yes. Um, nice which is weird because my wife probably doesn't dream about large women <laughs> no. but that has also been maybe shortened. she started so now it's part of now it's been shortened to just large women and so it's just part of like if i'm saying like good night to her i'll be like i love you i'll see you tomorrow large women yeah sleep well <laughs> yeah and, and i'll just move on and now it's just become part of our regular vernacular to, nice. like large women means sleep well by yes. the way as an aside on liar liar there's one thing that i feel is truly brilliant about that movie one scene uh, about it is when he goes through it's a very sitcom-y thing to like beat his beat himself up Mm -hmm. to try to get out of continuing for the day so that he can maybe come in tomorrow and be able to lie and everything he goes through all that and then uh he you know he he does that whole thing in front of the judge he's like you know worthless fool did this your honor blah 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 and then uh and then uh he goes okay i i see no no way we can do do anything but try to recess until tomorrow and everything unless of course you think you can go on yeah. and, and he's like yes i can that's great <laughs> uh we've uh, i've got a couple of like wife and i lines too like uh in best in show there's the the christopher guest character has a, the hound dog and everything and he can name all the mm. hound dogs and all that stuff um and when he's leaving to go to the, the the dog show his buddy comes out and he's like well you taking him fishing you taking you taking him fishing and he's like no no we're not going fishing we're going to a dog show and he goes up to the dog and he's like who's gonna catch a big fish who's going to yeah. fishing <laughs> And so anytime we call our dog or anything like that, we're like, who's going fishing? Who's going to catch a big fish? And he gets all excited and everything. He didn't obviously know what we made. Yeah. <laughs> and then anytime we're listing something off or we're just like, you know, I need this or there's this, you know, derivation, this kind of thing. So like, oh, we always go to like the, the Bubba Gump or the Bubba from uh, Forrest yeah. Gump where it's like boiled shrimp, fried shrimp, yeah. shrimp creole. <laughs> you can saute it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's just a little short. I always do the Gump's list of the different types of rain. Big old fat rain. <laughs> and a bit of skin and rain. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the rain just seemed like it just jumped up at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen all kinds of rain. Yes. All right. All right. Well, that that's some uh, that's some mail bagging. We right made a there. dent in that one. We did. Uh, we teabagged it. Um, but keep ca- coming with those questions. Uh, we do eventually get to a lot yeah, of them. I like the variety of this because we we had some serious questions. Uh, we had some thoughtful questions. We had some silly questions. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I like I like our listeners, man. Yeah. We got we got some good good people that listen to. We us. have a variety of places that you can go uh, uh, provide these questions. It's uh, Sincast presented by Cinema Sins on Facebook. That's me. Uh, <laughs> that's me. Uh, SoundCloud. That's Barrett. That's right. Twitter. The Cinema Sins Twitter. That's Jeremy. That's me. And uh, then we have Reddit. That's also Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, I pop in there every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but there are a lot of ways to find us and uh, submit questions and the like. Uh, we like uh, answering them when we can get around to them. That's right, But uh, that'll do it for this week. It's Chris Atkins and Jeremy Scott and Barrett Share. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasends.com. I saw a picture of her. She put on social media uh, something about her baby. She had a baby, and she was doing something else with her other hand. It was like multitasking. The actress Marina, Marina Bacarin. Or, oh yeah, yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, maybe the reason she wasn't in Deadpool two very much was that she was pregnant or oh, having a baby. That'd be interesting. And they shot around it in the beginning and mm-hmm. the end scenes or whatever. Because I always it always struck me as a little bit strange. Yeah, that they brought her back. For five minutes, mm-hmm. <laughs> but not and just to, to kill sit, her off. You know what? That makes her back. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because otherwise she's just sitting in that chair the whole time, right? Mm-hmm. Like on the the upside down or whatever that is. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> when did she have the kid? Oh, I don't know. I didn't go any googling beyond that. I was just uh, the kid looked, you know, like it had been born within the last year or less. I actually successfully spelled Marina Bakir. God damn, she's pretty. Yeah, she is. She she uh she was quite the looker on uh, Firefly, man. She's been with us through some good stuff because mm-hmm. she was on Homeland, Homeland too. Yeah, pregnant with her child in like 2015, so probably not interesting. Because the first one came out, and it was shot way before that. But the first one came out came out in, out in 2015. Right? Yeah, I think that was that. I mean, who knows what happened to that story? Considering the director left the project and all that, there's <laughs> so no telling what happened to it. So, you know who else is pretty? Yeah. Bryce Dallas Howard. Yeah, she is. Man. I like Man, I had to cut us in because I, I know we try not to do this thing with physical appearance, but have her eyes never looked normal? Like, she has lizard eyes, right? What? Like, what? she has, like, her eyes look android. Am I crazy? Yes. I'm not, I think her, she's her very. Her eyes are piercing. I think she's very pretty. But I'm, I. Did you say lizard eyes? Lizard eyes. <laughs> no, her eyes are very piercing. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean by that. I know what you mean by that. But, uh, yeah, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes people aren't able to pull those off. I think she can for some reason. I wonder yeah, how, long, man. how long of a podcast do you think we'd do if it was just, hey, you know who's pretty? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be a long, long podcast. You know what, I, what bothers me the most about uh, Fallen Kingdom? The movie fucking sucks. Yeah. You saw it in theaters, right? I did. Right? Oh, God. Uh, when- and you, you know what? I, when I did the schedule for October, I really wanted to be on oh, Jurassic right. World. Yeah, but I wanted to on. be on it, but I was on six already, yeah. so I couldn't do it. So I mean, I, that got me like Pete's Dragon level it's of angry. Awful. <laughs> well, the, the I I feel like they. I don't know if it's because they didn't want to have too many parallels to the Lost World, but but I, I felt like the whole. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, I felt like. <laughs> I felt like it would have been better if they had to save dinosaurs and they had to uh, get it done before the volcano erupted and all that. And, and that was the movie. Yeah. Instead of let's go get the dinosaurs. Oh, the volcano erupted. Now we're back in the we're back wherever the fuck. The, fucking Northern California. Yeah, they North, got from Costa Rica to fucking yeah. Northern California and, in like uh, three hours. And then they do this whole, you know, like I said before, they do this whole taken shit with the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. We wrote something about Oh, good, good, good. Uh, it yeah. gets very, I almost, because I started writing at first about, uh, how how james bondy it kind of felt because mm-hmm. there's like a mansion and all these international evils are showing up <laughs> but then once the auction kicks in it's so taken yeah <laughs> and also even worse than the boat trip from costa rica to northern california is the idea that you can at a moment's notice summon together in one place a hundred of the world's most evil rich people who want to buy killing machines <laughs> and they were supposed to be there the day before too. was there, there like a, a blast an email blast that yeah. went out like- oh yeah <laughs> they sent out a mass text they yeah and and 
just I never understood either why buying a dinosaur is going to help you like completely just dominate people in war. No, like like if these dinosaurs can be shot and they can be captured and all this other stuff, then what? There's no, they're not indestructible. They're in cages. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're presented not, to you in cages. Yeah, they're not indestructible. They're not. They're not the the solution if somebody throws a nuke at you. <laughs> <laughs> Send in the dinosaurs. <laughs> Fuck that nuke. <laughs> yeah, so, Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, movie's fucked up and terrible. Oh, God. <laughs> fucked up and terrible. Yeah. Oh, you know what I heard on the way over? What? It's the end of the world as we know it. Oh, the song or yeah. a headline from the news anchor? Uh, The song. That sounds like yeah. something Kent Brotman would say. Yeah. <laughs> It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, it's a song by REM. <laughs> you probably would notice this. Did you ever notice there's a there's a there's a third harmony in that when it breaks down to just the vocals, where it's like it's the end of the world as we know it. There's a middle like third in oh, there, okay, that I never picked up on before. And when you hear because it's got a, ah, da, da, that time alone, yeah, and it's got those four like interlocking harmonies going on there's a like a, there's a fourth one i didn't realize there was it's a literally the closest it. rem ever gets to be in the beach boys yeah yeah that's that true. little vocal breakdown with the harmonies and i like rem and the beach boys that wasn't supposed to be a dig at anybody are you like an rem fan no but one of my best friends uh justin from college i was in a band with him he lives in nashville still um and uh, he's uh, about as big an RM. I don't. I think Michael Stipe is less an RM fan than <laughs> especially this days. guy is. Uh, so I've heard pretty much all of it. It's uh, good. There, there's a couple, couple, couple albums in there where it's just great, and mm -hmm. I would say classic. And then the really, really early stuff is a little too raw for me, and the late stuff is a little too meandery for me. And you know, there's two, three albums in the middle. Automatic runs. for the people. Automatic for the People is my first CD purchase. Me too. Man, all How the way. is that possible? I don't know. I, I received, that was my first purchase. I received Bon Jovi's Keep the Faith CD single as my first CD. Mm -hmm. But I, the first purchase was yeah. Automatic for the People. Hey, kids, crack a lack. <laughs> Tie another one to your back. Um, what, uh, the, uh, one thing I don't understand is the, uh, it's, it's the end of the world as we know it is the music video. Like it's the cheapest music video that it really is. they could ever make. It's the, it's the kid and his dog and they're out in like some desolate, like, you know, there's one house. Like it's all that video. I don't get it. I never understood it. What was that on? It wasn't on green. It was on, uh, uh, out of time, out of time, but what? it was those three out. Well, I probably out of time. And then uh, Monster, did you like Monster? I, Monster was the last one I bought. Yeah. And I like it more than most, even though it's, it is sort of like their Zeropa. Like it's sort of their like experimental. I like Monster electronic. too. Monster's got more guitar and shit in it. Yeah. Yep. That's such a great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's on Document, by the way. It's the Document. Yeah. That's another good album. I like it. Yeah. It's I like your it a time, lot. but you're doing it on our time. Yeah. <laughs> We will tell you what time that time is. <laughs> you can have some time <laughs> on my time. <laughs> the important thing is the time. Yes. I cannot kill my friend. Kill, kill my, my friend. friend. I mean, can I keep any of that? I can't keep any of that. I, I, I don't know. 